Hey, Josh. Been praying for you, buddy. You did a great job. I, I saw the memorial service. It was amazing. Your mom, your brother, they all, you all did a great job. It was very moving. And literally the next day I had Alex, my son Alex, come over with his really nice camera and take some good pictures of Bethany because your parents are both such great photographers that... Uh, I realized we didn't have any pictures. Like, we just didn't have any pictures of us, like good quality pictures of us. So it was, it was, uh, it inspired actual change in that regard uh, as well. So, not to mention be thankful. So, oh. Oh, yeah, no, I, I yeah, I know the page turner things. I, I keep telling the church to pick them up so we, I don't have to buy one, but yeah. A lot of composers I work for, they'll tell me, oh, just, just put it on the music on your iPad. Don't print it up, you know, because I'm always printing up music. And I really like to have it because I want to mark it up. I want to be able to put it right here or here or, any, you know, anywhere. I don't want to have to charge it up. Um, and... Um, Yeah, so you know, it's it's. I'm I'm not opposed to the iPad. We that's what we use every week at church. Um, they come in handy. I was a little bummed at first because the drag about the iPad is you only have one page, and normally on a chart you could have two pages. So if it was a two-page song, you don't have to worry about changing pages, especially if you're having to go back for codas and junk like that. So I'm not a fan of you know that. And I know you can turn it sideways and go landscape and then you have two pages but then the print is like teeny tiny and I can't read it so uh. wow everybody's showing up it's because I posted on all the socials <laughs> um we're gonna um yeah we're gonna talk about songwriting and this is gonna this could go on for a long time I could talk about songwriting for a very long time my eyes are all blurry. I don't think I have the sleep out of my eyes yet. Um, but I, but songwriting, um, it doesn't necessarily, just because you're songwriting doesn't necessarily mean you're, we're going to slow down our um, growth as a guitar player. In fact, it may speed it up in a lot of ways because um, a lot of times I write songs, I tell you this, a lot of times I write songs to practice something I need practice on. But instead of writing an exercise that's maybe very academic sounding or very mechanical sounding or it sounds like a machine or something. I try to turn it into some kind of musical idea that now I have content. If I record it, I've got content. So we may talk about that too, recording and everything too. That's a little bit harder to talk about, but man, everybody's on. Pepper, hi, Josh, Holly, Bruce, Dennis, all of my moderators are here. Everybody's excited to get started. Roger, Leo, um, Dash is here. Good to see Dash and Leo. Both Alan Floyd's here. Um, so, uh-oh, Dennis says a stop sign. What did, what did I miss? Bruce reminded you. Uh, wait a minute. Did I miss something, Dennis? Well, also, I don't know if you noticed, but my YouTube, I, I actually blew past 98,000 subscribers. Um... But uh, apparently my how, how to play most anything in Open D is, it, is, is trending. So um, it doubled my 48 hour view count. Normally, well, not normally. Back when I was doing co when we first started doing this, I was getting 20, 30,000 views every 48 hours. And it dropped down into the 6,000 views, which was pretty bad. You know, it's like, oh man. Um, and so uh, uh, it's been in the 11, 12,000 views in the last, for the last few days. And that's because of that video started trending. Now it's starting to slow down, but, but Bruce, it's interesting because I was like, I'm, there's no way I'm going to hit a hundred thousand by the end of the year. Um, but I'm, I, I've gotten 
1,059 new subscribers in the last 28 days. So you do the math. I mean, it's it could literally happen on New Year's Eve. <laughs> I could literally get my... And I've got two videos. I just filmed two videos, but I haven't uploaded them yet. One is... Um, uh, one is why so many banjos. <laughs> so I'm going to do a video about why so many banjos. Uh, I already did the video. I just have to edit it. And then the other one, I am doing um, a video on my favorite licks from the song Question Mark that I, you know. My, uh, the, that song. So I um, uh, basically uh, am going to... Um, uh, Post that one's taken a long time because I have to create a lot of, of screen caps, you know, a lot of music examples and things like that. So I don't know. That may take a while. I probably should do the banjo one first, but um, but I want to start talking about songwriting. And I'm, I was just in the last week I've been formulating what am I going to talk about? And it's I'll tell you, it's no small task. But I I thought what we could do. I'm gonna take it pretty slow, but. Um, what I'd like to do is have everybody um, by next Monday have a chord progression that they wrote. And it may be a chord progression you've heard before. That doesn't necessarily mean you, you can't write over it. We're going to talk about that too. What's copyrightable and what's not copyrightable. Um, but yeah, thanks. Hey, John. L Lena Chen's in the house. Oh, good. Oh, you're excited. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad this... this um, and this applies to piano too. That We're, we're going to talk about chords, harmony, structure, lyrics, melodies, production, what makes a song. And uh, of course, there. Are, I guess we could break down songs into two groups, instrumental and, and uh, lyric. Uh, basically, that's what, when I register a song with BMI, that's pretty much the only question they ask uh, about the song itself. They don't ask the key. They don't ask you, know, ask you even to upload it. They don't ask you to tell the tempo. None of that stuff. They just say, what's... Um, you know, what, uh, what, it, what, it, they don't even ask the genre. If I'm uploading a song to CD Baby, they do. They ask for the genre and then the subgenre. <laughs> and they ask for like some alternates. Um, but with, um, uh, but with BMI and ASCAP, when you're registering the song, they really don't ask that. All they need to know is the name, who worked on it, that kind of thing, because they're just sending the monies to the people. Um, um, but uh, they do want to know. And the other thing they they ask, I guess it's it's maybe three questions um, from a performance from the PRO standpoint. Okay, one is is it, does it have lyrics? You know, is it instrumental? Is it music and lyrics, or is it classical? Because interestingly, classical music pays more per minute or per second. Uh, than non-classical. I'm always tempted to hit the classical button for every one of my songs. <laughs> are they ever going to hear the song? I'm not uploading the song. What do they know? You know, um, but it's like something like four times as much. So you know, those classical composers, the contemporary composers, that very, very, very rarely get any real airtime because their music's maybe too weird. Uh, they actually get paid a little bit more than the rest of us. So I don't feel so bad about that. Hey, Gary, what's going on? Um, oh, thanks, Bruce. Let me grab that Discord invite um, and, 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 and pin it, okay? So I'm sorry. Let me do that. I forgot. Edit. Okay. Okay. And um, so first thing I want to do, I mean, gosh, I could do a thousand videos on songwriting. It's really difficult to, to pick one thing to talk about. But what I mean, the, the reasons to write is uh, one of the reasons I write, I feel, is because um, uh, the Bible teaches that we're made in the image of the Father, meaning God. And God created this earth and the universe and everything. If you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim, you basically believe this. And um, and so I think it's just innate in us. It's one of the things that's just innate, that's a God thing, that's innate in us that we have to do. And I don't care if it's a mom 
my mom was very, very creative in the kitchen. She could, we could get home from vacation and she would open up a, a, an empty fridge and she'd figure out something and make it a gourmet dinner out of it. I, I don't know how she did it, but she was creative. Um, I just, I'm always creating, you know, with guitar, I'm writing ideas, I'm, I've, I've, I'm writing music for TV and for other things um, and for, for different producers. So it's a, it's a pretty much nonstop thing for me, but I feel like it's just a natural thing to do. So in some ways, writing music is just another way for that part of you that's innate inside you to come out and it feels good. There's something about it. It's like, wow, I did this. I created something. I mean, we all know it when you build a birdhouse or when you build a building or a, you know, a tree house or whatever, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think we have to create. I just don't, I, I can't explain it any other way. So, um, I mean, a little kid will shape his mashed potatoes into you know, Santa Claus head or whatever, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's just whatever. It's, it's supernatural. I mean, my kids loved Lego. I loved Legos. Legos was my favorite toy growing up. And my, so as an adult and having boys, it was huge because I could spend lots of money on Legos and not feel guilty. <laughs> so every Christmas, in fact, I got to buy something for this. I got to make sure they have Legos under the tree because it's always that thing you shake and you know what it is. So uh, it's like it's like when I was a kid, you would get an album, and you knew it was an album because it was flattened, twelve by twelve. So, um, but but also, I feel like aside from writing, because I think you, almost we're all you know being we're all called to be creative. I think um, being made in the image of the Father. Oh, I got a spider. Ooh, there's a spider right there, a little one. Keep an eye on it, though. <laughs> I'm still gonna keep an eye on it. It's a little spider, but like, that's the. One, I'm just always afraid it's gonna like drop on my head while I'm talking. Um, where'd he go? Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, see, I created a joke there. You see that? See what I did? Um, also, um, creating for uh, writing music for for profit. I mean, clearly, most of my income comes from cr stuff I've created. Mo uh, you know, I would say 60 to 70 percent of my income is um, is royalty based. Um, and it's been um, I, I just realized uh, the first thing I ever wrote that got in a movie I did in 2005. So it's about 15 years in the making. You know, it took a long while. Um, but every one of those little songs, that one song I wrote in 2005 is still making me money. It was in a movie called. Um, uh, shoot. Uh, Supercross, um, and I think I told the story, but it was, I, I'll probably tell the story at some point on, on one of my videos, I'll do a video about it, but um, it was, just, you know, in, 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 in a movie, there's three types of music, there's um, score, which is what John Williams does, there are needle drops, which if you watch an Adam Sandler, you know, when they put that Aerosmith song in, that's called a needle drop, okay, um, they, um, uh, when, um, and then there's something called source. If someone's driving a truck and they're listening to an AM radio and there's a country station or whatever, they need someone to write that music. Okay. There's three. So the, the first song I ever got in a movie was because one of the bands that had a needle drop in, in the movie, um, uh, Supercross, uh, they, I think they paid every band like $500 for a license for all their songs, but this one band, and they never pay the license until the movie, the release date, because movies oftentimes don't get released and they don't need to pay a royalty. They don't need to pay a license fee if it never gets released. Um, so I, you know, if you agree to a license fee, you know, know that you're not going to get it until the movie actually comes out. But then it comes right away. Um, but one of the bands wanted twenty thousand dollars for their song, and I don't think they paid more than five hundred for any songs. So the composer Jasper Randall and I, they they asked him if he would write a song, and he goes, "I don't know how to write rock music." Tom, would you write a so rock song with me? I said, "Sure, let's do it." So we did it for a dollar. Um, but I. I stopped counting, but at, when I stopped counting how much money I made off that song, it was in the six to seven thousand dollar range. Okay, and that's been years since I stopped counting. Uh, but now it's it's coming in at tw you know two dollars every quarter or four dollars every quarter, whatever. So it's probably seventy five hundred dollars now. But 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 money is another reason to to create uh, create the, you know content creators. That's what this world is all composed of now. Um, there are content creators that get 
more views on their content than network television shows. It's astonishing. So it's definitely, creating is definitely something that, that can be profitable. And, and, and doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, <laughs> Holly, I'm, no, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that spider. Help. Hey, Holly, remind me every now and then to look at the spider because I want to make sure he's not getting over my head. Um, and then, uh, oh, your name's not weird. My name's weird <laughs> in some countries. Uh, my, my Tom probably means bad things in some languages. <laughs> Sometimes it means bad things in English because <laughs> it's attached to me. Um, so, um, I, also, I I think personally, for me, um, songwriting, particularly songwriting, like writing lyrics and music and melodies and everything, is great therapy. Um, you know, and a lot of us. And, and I, I, Someone I we know is is had had a major thing happen in their life. Any anytime you've had a major thing happen in your life, um, sometimes getting it out, you know, not holding it in or writing about it, can can be very therapeutic. But it also can create an amazing song. I mean, I think half of Adele's songs are that. I know half of Taylor Swift songs are "I'm in love with that boy," and the other half of her songs are "I hate that boy." <laughs> <laughs> so I know Taylor writes for therapy. Um, I feel like uh, the first song I ever wrote with Justin Bieber, that, well, Bieber and I wrote um, uh, the, the song for his mom, but I, they gave me writers on that because I just wrote a little bit of a, um, the bridge I wrote on the bridge. So they gave me 5%. Uh, but still, that ended up being a little bit of money. Um, is there a Lego song? I think there is a Lego song, but we could... Tim, remember that because that may be a, a great exercise. Is we all write a song about Legos <laughs> and see what we come up with, or at least a lyric. You know, try to come up with a Lego lyric. So, but the first song I wrote with Justin, uh, where it was just the two of us basically writing, was "Yellow Raincoat," and. Um, <laughs> I did a video on how to play this, but, but he loved that hook, and I and, and he said, "Tom, can I write to that?" And of course, I joked with him and said, "Why? What, what, what would ever happen with it? you know?" And uh, but he got in there. I I tracked it. Actually, the recording is the first pass of me doing it. And I actually played it faster than I normally played it, just because I I was like. It was the tempo of the song we did before, and it was already the click was already set. So it was normally a, I didn't wouldn't normally play that fast, but the recording you're hearing is the first pass. And then Justin spent about I don't know four or five hours um, in the booth, sitting on a stool, singing each phrase and writing on the lyrics on his phone, um, and um, and just kind of and he was and it was he was right he was going through some of the worst part of his his struggles in his life. And how everybody was attacking him from all different places, and he was kind of writing about that, and that's what the yellow raincoat was to kind of protect him. It was like a, a so it was definitely a therapeutic song for him. He, he actually really liked singing it when he did it. I don't think he, I don't think he's done it in a while, but he did he did tweet a little bit ago because he heard it and he was like he heard it again for some reason. And he was like, oh, I forgot the song is fire. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. But um, um, the. Uh, but I've written a lot of songs, a lot of songs. Um, I've written political songs back in the day when I, you know, had a band and stuff like that. Um, I wrote a song called Good News Doesn't Sell. Um, I wrote, you know, I, I had uh, Thought Bombs was another song <laughs> that I wrote. Um, and so uh, back in the eight, you know, 80s when I had a police type band. So we're going to talk about that aspect, of, you know, of why write. Um, but, but I think just... Just to get us started, we're going to talk. I want. I want to go through what are, what constitutes a song, okay? And then we're going to talk about. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep a little list here. Um, I'm going to create a new text box. And at first, it's going to be giant. So, song elements. Okay, and then, all right,
Maybe I'll put it up here <laughs> so we can see it. All right. So, um, so the first thing maybe it comes to mind um, is melody. Okay. Let's see if this works. I'm going to put a, oh, it did. Okay. I'm going to put a copyright symbol after that. A melody is, is, is really, in my opinion, and of course that's changing based on some stupid jury verdicts. Um, and it's had a, it's having a chilling effect on the industry, but melody is one of the, one of the elements that's, um, uh, <clears throat> that's um, uh, copyrightable, okay? Um, but, you know, and then there's something called public domain. So if you wanted to write a melody, a, a, song, a pop song with the melody, you wanted the bridge to be for Jaka, you could probably do that because that would be public domain. Now, does that mean you own for Jaka from now on? No. Um, but yeah, that would be one of the elements. Oh, yeah, my norms. We watched Spinal Tap with some people who had never watched Spinal Tap on Saturday, so it made me think of norms. How, uh, Lena's asking me, how many songs have I published? Uh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ah. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go, like Gary. That's what that song's about. Ooh, ah, ting, tang, walla, walla, bing, bang. That's about stepping on Legos, I guess. Uh, Lena, how many songs have I written and have published? Uh... Thousands. Yeah, because all the music I write for television, and I write a lot of music for television, gets published by the production company. So they own the publishing, and they do all that deal. They deal with that. Um, and then all the pop artists. So as far as, like, released on records, I don't know. I'm probably got 30 or 40 songs released on, maybe more than that, released on records. I had to compile a list of all those recently because of... Um, I, when I signed my publishing deal with Universal Music Group, so, um, but melody is is um, is definitely part is one of the elements that's uh, um, copyrightable. Okay, um, lyrics I also would consider generally copyrightable. Oops, that's not right. There it is. If you're wondering how I'm getting that C, I'm hit on 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 Mac computer. I'm in. Hitting option G gives you the copyright symbol, just so you know. Option G. Um, how does a songwriter decide? Okay, that's another good question. There's so many things to talk about. Um, when you're writing a song, any key works. Any key works, okay? Um, you're going, but, but my range, it's irrelevant. Okay, if you're writing, if you're starting from scratch, it's irrelevant what your range is. Completely irrelevant. If you're singing someone else's song, it's completely relevant. All right? So my here, um, so we so this goes in line with melody. And again, we're this is we're just doing this is just a quick synopsis. Obviously, I'm not talking about these elements in any great detail. Um, but the next one would be harmony, and that's chords. Okay. And um, I don't think that that's copyrightable. Chord, har harmony is, it, there might be rare cases where a chord progression might be considered so much of the hook. Um, even something like um, a simple chord progression like one, two, three, four. Four, three, two, one. That progression isn't copyrightable, but that rhythm might be. So if you wrote a song to it, you know, you might get in trouble. But if you did, that's here, there, and everywhere. It's the same chord progression. You could probably write over that because there's no rhythmic element to it. It's basically everywhere. Right? Uh, another song that just came to mind was That one 
also probably not copyrightable unless you played that melody over. Da, da. That's uh, the cure. Boys don't cry. Um, but if you wrote a song, you know it was like. That's not copyrightable. Okay. So we and we'll talk more about that. Okay. Now here's my point about melody. If if your range is D to D, let's say your lowest note you can sing is D, D, and D, this is your highest note. Does that mean you have to write every song in the key of D? No. Um, in, in the key of G, you could still play, no, you could still sing between D and D. You'd be singing from the fifth of, of the, the, the key to the fifth of the key, if that's your range. Um, same thing's true with, uh, let's see, I want to go, I don't know, what am I doing here? I feel like I'm off center. <laughs> I feel like I'm small for some reason, sitting further from the computer. Um, uh, but uh, if I wanted to write it in the key of E flat, that you'd be singing from the major seventh to major seventh, you still can sing, your melody can still fall between the two Ds and be fine in the key of E flat. So you, you, know, you could have so, so the key is completely irrelevant to your singing range or what's best for you when you're writing a song. The, like I said, the opposite is true when you're performing a song. Because if it's already a pre-written song, the melody is already in a constrained, predetermined, <laughs> you know, order of things. And if if it goes G to G, and you're like, oh, I can't see that, oh, you know, you're you're probably not going to want to do it in that key. Uh, if it's if the melody's from you know the root to the root, you can't G. G's going to be a bad key. You're going to want to move it to C or to to D or whatever, whatever's the best key for you. But the, but the key is irrelevant when writing. Um, so there's that. Um, uh, ba -dum -dum -dum. Do I know Norm? Yeah, I know Norm. Yeah. I mean, Alex knows, my son Alex knows him better. In fact, Alex has played on songs for Norm's son. And it, it's funny because they've gone to the studio and then his son will say, I forget his name's son, it's Josh maybe, um, will go they'll like go into to norms in the middle of the night and go grab guitars and go to the studio <laughs> i mean it's pretty cool alex has gotten to play some pretty cool guitars over. okay so um these are these are the kind of the three basic kind of conceptual things if you're going to play a guitar and sing a song this is kind of what you need okay but there are a lot more elements to a song um and there's some specific ones, um, and I, I, I'm I'm going to make this list. It's going to get kind of long, but if you if you if you think of anything, um, orchestration, okay. I think I'm spelling it right. Is that right? Somebody correct me if I'm not. But that's that's that would be. Uh, That would be the instruments involved, okay? Um, genre is a big one. All right, we could go, we could talk for days on genre, right? All the different genres. Um, you know, of course, you have things like tempo, key. We talked about key. Um, and then I, a very, very important part of a song, at least in pop music, is production. Also true, in, 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 if you're doing a rock song or a country song, there's going to be certain things that. Um, uh, so let's just start there. We get so we got quite a list there, um, and, I, and there's more than I'll, I'll think of in a second. I'm sure, but I'll add to those. If you've got one you can think of, um, uh, and this is where the the the. Um, uh, Sorry, let me click off of this. This is where the um, uh, the jury verdicts of the last couple of years have kind of, in my opinion, been off the 
off the reservation, um, production is not, I don't think copyrightable, but, but according to a couple juries, and I, I'm hoping those get overturned. I don't know if they're even trying to overturn them, but you know, pretty much everyone in the industry was like, yeah, the jury didn't know. The juries don't know anything about the music business. I remember when I was on a jury and it was a freight train versus a pedestrian. And I've told you this story. And, um, I learned more about freight trains and, and inertia than I ever thought I'd learn. Um, but I still didn't know one, one thousandth of what that engineer that had to take the stand that actually ran over the grandmother, <laughs> what he knew, you know? Um, and so when, when you, when you have a jury of people determining, oh, well that, yeah, it kind of sounds like it, it kind of sounds like this other song. So yeah, that's, yeah, but that's the whole point. We're all inspired by the, you know, if we couldn't sound like somebody else, there wouldn't be anybody doing music. Um, George Benson studied, you know, Charlie Christian, West Montgomery, and, you know, imitated Charlie Christian, West Montgomery, and Django Reinhardt. And if he couldn't do that, then he wouldn't exist. Uh, the Beatles loved Buddy Holly and uh, uh, Jerry, uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and, and um, Chuck Berry and... I mean, you know, American rock and R&B, and if they couldn't copy that, the Beatles wouldn't exist. So to, you know, to, to say that uh, Marvin Gaye was, you know, copyright was infringed on because they had a Fender Rhodes playing the bass line at a cowbell and people goofing, you know, laughing in the background, um, to say that's a copyright infringement is ridiculous. It was a loving tribute to the song. And um, the problem is, if Marvin Gaye were alive, I guarantee he would never have sued, not in a million years. But his, you know, I'll say it here on YouTube, immortalized, but his, his, uh, his family, his heirs, apparently don't know how to make their own money. And, and the, the, the millions that he brings in to them isn't enough, apparently. So... Um, it, you know, and this is a perfect example. I, you know, the, the, what song is it? The Ed Sheeran got sued by the estate of Marvin Gaye because of that groove. Really? And I think Marvin Gaye did. He did a B minor chord or a, it was, well, for one thing, I think they were half step off, which may have been accidental, may have been intentional, uh, may have been, it just sounded like the vibe. I think one was in A flat and one was in G, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I've seen the comparisons. Uh, uh, how to write a song in guitar. Lyric plus melody plus harmony plus rhythm. Yeah. Oh, I forgot rhythm. You're right. Rhythm is a very important part. And I'll, I'll tell you another one, too. And, and Well, and this is one where we're going to have... Um, uh, I'll, I'll put rhythm after tempo because I feel like those are kind of hand in hand, right? Um, they kind of they kind of support each other. Like certain rhythms work great at certain tempos, but not at other tempos, right? Uh, rhythm. Um, uh, another. Uh, what's another one I just thought of? Uh, shoot, when you said rhythm, it made me think of. Made me think of. Uh, Another one. Oh, thanks, Darnell. Yeah, join that Discord. It's all, it's all, all of my uh, um, PDFs and, and JPEGs and everything are posted there. Um, production. What was the other thing I was thinking? Genre, tempo. Oh, well, I'll think of it again. It's not a big deal. Oh, uh, fudge. Okay. And sorry, I apologize. Oh, you know what? I can, I can, I can fix that. <laughs> it's like, dang it. I can't. Oh, that made it worse. <laughs> I forget that, hey, Hol or, hey, Pepper, I'm wearing pants, look. <laughs> Pepper's never sure. Um, but yeah, so, you know, that groove. And the melody wasn't the same, the lyrics weren't the same, the, the, uh, the drum groove was similar, but again, it's, you can't copyright, oh, groove, I guess, could be another thing. Groove is different than rhythm. Tempo, that's different. Groove kind of falls more in under genre sometimes, but
But even that, you know, you can have the different grooves. Obviously, you can have different grooves in the same genre. Let's see, what am I doing here? Where did I want to put? Okay, groove. And this is not the one I wanted to think of. So <laughs> the list is going to get bigger. Let me put it that way. And these are all elements we're going to talk about. All right. Um, the first element we're going to talk about today, I think, is or the only element I'm really going to talk about, even just marginally, we, we, we can talk a lot further on this, is, uh, oh, yeah, wait, wait, why are we taking a sip, Sam? What's the, what's the occasion? I'm sure I touched my face. We used to have, we, well, we don't, did used to have, we have a drinking game that Gary is the, um, is the uh, scribe for, and um, if I, there's a lot of rules. If I drop a pick, we, we, uh, Take a drink. If I drop a thumb pick, we take two sips. Um, if I touch my face, so everybody can take a drink now. Yes. Oh, and hook. Hook is, yeah. Oh, that was it, Gary. Thank you. That was actually the thing I was thinking of, hook. Okay. So I'm going to put hook up here by, let, let me, let me just, let me just kind of highlight some of these things. So, we may play a game at some point. I I, um, I may have to do a video where I, I know I'm not going to monetize. But where I play a song and I ask you, where's the hook? Okay. So I I, I may do that. I may do a vi one of our one of our month Monday uh, lessons will be non monetized, and I'll play a song and and you guys tell me the hook. Now, and and, and we're talking pop music. See. Um, Classical music, well, you know, classical music has hooks, and, they, and there's rhythmic hooks. Dun 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 dun, dun 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 dun. Is a melodic and a rhythmic hook, but it, that rhythmic hook, you get da 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 da. That melodic movement and rhythm gets repeated throughout the piece, um, and you know, you'll hear it in scores like uh, you know uh, Luke's theme in Star Wars. You'll hear anytime Luke's on screen, you'll hear it. You may not know you're hearing it. The first time you hear it stated, it might be full orchestra kind of thing with the strings. But another time, it might be something maybe going on, and a, a solo flute might play Luke's theme. Okay, um, it's you know, or, or you know, composing for film is such an amazing thing. It's really just well, John Williams is amazing <laughs> personally. I mean, he's just nobody better than that. Um, but. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, so a hook could be a lot of things. I've talked about this before. I, you know, I I, um, I feel like the hook to uh, um, to creep by Radiohead is when the guitar goes. <coughs> so it's not even a pitch. It's just <coughs> when it kicks in. Um, that's the hook because that's the thing that got me to go to the Tower Records and go. Hey, I heard the song on the radio and I couldn't remember anything, but I said it goes. Kunk, kunk. <laughs> you know, and um, uh, and the guy immediately said, "Oh, that's Radiohead." And I went, "Who? <laughs> I've never heard of them." So it 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 that's you know the hook could could be that's a hook. Uh, the melody on that song, day tripper, yeah, day tripper, yeah. Nah, it's not really a hook. The hook is the bass line. Same with. Right, beat it, beat it, beat it, beat it, beat it. Now when I say beat it, beat it, that's an okay hook. It's a pretty boring melody, but the hook, the thing that really pulls people in uh, and makes people call the radio station, is probably right. Um, uh, uh, you know, the a hook can be a lyric. Um, it could be, it could be. I think uh, what was the first. Ed Sheeran's first hit was one where he talked really fast, right? It was the hook was his little his gimmick that his his shtick that he did he, when he was a busker in in London, and he would do these really fast rap things, and he was like this white guy with red hair and pale skin and played acoustic guitar and he could rap and it was like what the heck and that's kind of was his hook that got people to look at him as a, an artist, but also the first song that he had, uh, one of his first hits was that. So um, I am playing a Martin D35. It's a 70s Martin. And the, somebody told me that it's a 35 because it has three, the three stands for three piece back. 
I never knew that. I didn't know that when I bought it. I just thought, oh, it's a 35. Um, Gibson's, their numbers were the price, which is depressing. A 175 cost $175. A 335 is $335. The 125 was 120. But those, that's really the origin of their numbers. Gibson 175. That's a weird way to. It's like, I'll take the uh, barbecue sauce 199, please. <laughs> it was the barbecue sauce that, that Beth found it on uh, uh, at Walmart, the barbecue sauce that was on the shelf behind Mark Zuckerberg when he was doing something the other day. <laughs> he was talking and it was like an empty shelf except for some barbecue sauce. It was like, what the heck? Uh, the real money, sir. Oh! Let's see. Um, hey, Reed. Oh, yeah, that was your question. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, Horse With No Name is kind of... Yeah, and I guarantee you they're just, like, goofing off. I, I, can't, I can't even tell you how many songs... Uh, that when you hear the story about him, how many started out as a jam session in the studio? They were just jamming in the studio. Um, and uh, you know what? I wonder, can I do... Um, I wonder, can I underline just one thing or does it all have to... Eh, you know what? I may just put a space after this or like this. I can do this. All right. So, um, but that, yeah, that would come under the, the, the groove, harmony and groove. If that, if that harmony had no groove, it would sound like this. That's basically grooveless. I'm doing quarter notes, right? Would not have been a hit, right? So you're, so, so Gary, I think what we've determined is that maybe that groove is the, the groove is the, is the hook. It's a great hook. I mean, it is. It's, it's like amazing, and it's just instantly recognizable. It's sad that these songs are getting older and older and getting less and less airplay. Um, we've been talking. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about that lately. Like, as the when the Stones die, it's like who are the who are the legacy acts that are going to tour? I mean, you know, I guess you could say uh, Bon Jovi's a legacy act, so he's still, you know, he's my age, so I guess he's got a few years left in him. <laughs> I hope. I mean, Mick is un freaking believable 80 years old the way he struts around that stage. So it's crazy. Dust in the Wind is a great, I think that Dust in the Wind, you know, that's the, really the hook. The intro is the hook. It immediately has the, this kind of, I don't have a thumbnail right now, that's why I wouldn't play it for good, but, um, um, but, it immediately has this kind of, you know, um, Renaissance uh, medieval vibe to it. Um, so that's kind of the vibe of the song. The melody is the most obvious melody. In fact, one of the funniest bits in, in uh, my opinion, one of the funniest bits in Spinal Tap. And if you haven't seen this is Spinal Tap, you may have to. I don't know if it's on any of the streamers, but... Um, not on any of my streamers, but this is Spinal Tap. It's pretty freaking amazing. People thought it was a real band. It was kind of the original mockumentary. But there's a scene where Nigel Tufnell, the guitar player, and they all actually play all their own instruments. So they all can play and write, and they did all that playing and writing. They're actors that did all the playing. And they're not British, which is funny because my, my brother-in-law is British. He was like, he goes, their, their accents are brilliant like spot on like you he thought they were british but uh nigel's playing the piano and talking about oh yeah i want to do this thing and he's playing this you know d minor he's playing that right d minor to b flat to a minor to uh, 
to G, G minor. Now, what that is, is that when the key of D, that would be the one chord, to the sixth chord in the key of D, which is B flat, major, and then A minor is the five chord. Sometimes we use A7 or A major, but A minor is the, in, in pure D minor, A minor is the five chord, and that's okay. Then he talks about how he lines intertwining and all this stuff, right? It's so inside baseball, though. He's going like, you know what? I'm really inspired by Mozart and Bach. I'm kind of like Mach, <laughs> right? He says that. But then he sings. He goes, like, the horn line would be this. And he goes, da, 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 da. All he's doing there is he's singing, I kid you not, the root of each one of those chords. <laughs> it's just singing the root. It's like the least imaginative melodic idea, harmonic idea, possible, right? It would be what the basses are playing. He goes, the horns, you know, being probably the French horns or the English horns. He kind of does this, like he's, like he's creating some amazing harmony. And of course, uh, Rob Reiner, who's the, pretending to be the director, he's the actor. That, uh, Rob Reiner is the director, but he's, he's playing the director in the movie too. He's like, he's just sitting there kind of like hanging on his every word in awe. <laughs> it's freaking brilliant. Uh, very, 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 very good. Yeah, turn it up to 11, exactly. This, why not just make 11 louder and be 10 be the last? And he, Nigel just doesn't understand that. He's like, but, but these go to 11. <laughs> Funny. I love when they get lost backstage in Cleveland, too, and they just do circles around the back. And then the, the custodian says, well, you take a jog to the left and... and, and uh, uh, Harry Shearer says, well, we don't have time for that. <laughs> we don't have time for a jog. Oh, man, that movie's freaking awesome. So, yeah, so, um, so Dust in the Wind, I definitely think the hook is, is that, is that guitar part, clearly, you know. Um, and then you, there could be multiple hooks in a song, don't get me wrong. Um, shoot, I think you could have a hook from a song title. Um... I have a friend uh, who's a great songwriter, very good songwriter, actually one of my favorite songwriters. Um, uh, he wrote a song, um, I forget who the artist was, but they, they lived here, I was friends with them here, and then they, they, with a bunch of our friends, moved to Nashville in 1994, and he ended up, he's already was a good songwriter, but he did, wasn't getting any kind of recognition for it until he moved to Nashville. And... Um, uh, the um, thank you. Um, and uh, he wrote a song. The song title was "Does My Ring Burn Your Finger." That's it. I already know it's going to be a good song. <laughs> I mean, but besides the fact that Buddy Miller's name is attached to it, uh, Buddy Miller is the is the songwriter friend of mine, and uh, he's a record producer too. Look him up. He's, he does. He, he and his wife have records out. He has records out. Very gruff kind of guy. He's the guy I told you about that, like, he will tour and Robert Plant will play harmonica in his band. <laughs> That's how cool Buddy is. So, the air you breathe. Oh, the air that you breathe. Oh, spider. Oh, the spider's gone. Oh, dang it. Where'd that spider go? <laughs> He's totally gone. Where did you go, little spider? Man. Oh. <laughs> uh, did you ever remind me, Holly? You guys are all talking amongst yourselves. Right. Uh, me, my, my knees hurt. Um, yeah, the, so the solo to... Uh, yeah, and a lot of times solos do that. Um... I, you know, I, uh, what's, you know, I'm not a, I mean, I don't mind doing a solo song. I have, you know, I, I did a lot of solos on stuff in the eighties. It was a big thing. Uh, Beat It was a classic, like after Beat It came out, every, you know, pretty soon every pop song had to have a rock solo, guitar solo in it for a while. That lasted for a couple of years and it kind of burned itself out. So you'll notice there's not a lot of rock guitar solos in pop songs. It doesn't really ever happen anymore. Um, but new chair? No, same old chair. Um, 
arachno arachnophobia. Greek for spider. -free. Yeah, I knew. Yeah, I know what arachnophobia is. I don't have arachnophobia. I'm not afraid of them. I just don't want them to startle me while I'm trying to work with you. You know, do this. <laughs> so, I know you're all afraid for me too. So, um, the hollies. Well, and there's a, an example of a chord progression. Um, uh, creep. You know, is is. Um, in the key of G, kind of, yeah, yeah, it's key of G. And it goes to major three chord. We're going to talk about harmony, you know. It goes to the four chord and then a minor four chord. We talked about this before last year, way back when. But then there, th that's also the chorus of a Holly song. Uh, I, I can't think of the Holly song. I'm sure somebody will say it right here. But it's the same chord progression. And then the, Lana Del Rey did a song a few years ago that had the same chord progression, and she got sued by, by uh, I almost said Spinal Tap, by Radiohead, because they copied her. But they, she actually did it. Did her melody sounded like the Radiohead song? Um, I'm a little Miss Muffet, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, Creep. It's funny because that's their most known song and it's they never perform it because they hate that song it's on their first record but it was kind of what made them fit. oh tom Burt, you're right catherine there's another um there's another element tom Burt, that can can come into play in a lot of different places um tom Burt is just kind of another word for tone but it's a little bit more directed for um and you could call it, say, timber, I think, but tomber is how I've always been taught to say it. Um, um, tomber is, you know, can be a tone of a singer. It could be a tone of an instrument, a tomber, a tone of the, someone playing an instrument. Like, my tomber is different than Alex's tomber on the same guitar. Um, or I could play a guitar, change guitars to get a different tomber. Um, and that does become part of the song. It doesn't, it's not a copyrightable song, part of the song. But it's like, I will be recording something and go, no, this guitar isn't right. You know, I'll be writing a song and I'll go, I'll, I'll do this one. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Gary. <laughs> now I'm, now I'm going to keep an eye on my sound hole here. Wait, where did that little guy go? This is just funny because he was a little teeny tiny guy. He's probably about that, maybe... That big? No, I'm just kidding. That that big. <laughs> so yeah, I guess when they move, up, although I guess they can hang down, they can drop down quick with their spider. That's what I'm afraid of. It's over my head. Everything's over my head. So uh, Gary Samson just dynamics. Uh, yeah, dynamics is definitely 100. percent That's right. And and uh, you know, um. And here's the thing, like, let me talk about production a little bit. Um, and dynamics would be volume, swells, things like that. Okay? Dynamics are very, very, I mean, think about how often, worship songs, oh my gosh, they are too dynamic. Um, they start out small, you know. Uh, Josh, you'll know what I'm talking about. You know, right? Where it's like... Uh, Whatever, and then all of a sudden you're like, you're... that's fine, right? Nothing wrong with that. And then back, and <laughs> literally there'll be ten of those in a song. Every worship song does this. It's like drives me crazy. Uh, and and uh, um, worship songs are the most formulaic of all. By out of necessity, worship writing, and I've written a lot of worship songs. I've had worship songs. Speaking of published, I've had worship songs published, recorded. Um, I actually, Josh, I have a um, a worship song that I wrote for Christmas because I always hated Christmas time. Everybody wanted to hear carols, and it's like you get tired of doing the arrangements of carols and all that stuff. So I wrote a worship song for Christmas that a bunch of churches do. Um, um, even uh, Candy and Jonathan um, from Atlanta. What was the what's the big church in Atlanta? They they actually were going to record it, which would have been huge if they actually did it. But he, uh, Jonathan and I were trying to write a bridge to it. We just couldn't find anything that we liked.
Oh, okay. Rhode Island. Oh, Bob. My sister teaches at RISD, so I know you know what RISD is. Um, so, um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, so, okay. Orchestration. Solo guitar is it orchestration. If I if I do something like if I uh, um, if I end up recording. I was born without that perception. Oh, so. oh the, the worship song actually is, let's see, if I remember. It's two chords, which I did that on purpose. But it's got some, you know, major sevenths and ninths and six and all that stuff in there. Uh, Josh, we'll touch base later, okay? And I'll see if I can find a recording of it. I don't know if I... Let's see. Glory to, let me see if I have it somewhere. It, and it would be... I may have a chart for it. It may be uh, me singing, which is not a good thing. But it would get the point across. But I, it's cool because I, I, I have the choir doing like a desk camp, like the background singer. At the time we were using a choir. Um, and. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. It's really bad, though. Pretty fast. Dude. Oh, you know what? Will it play? It may not play because I'm. Oh, wait, am I muted? May not play because I'm using uh, OBS right now, so uh, which is weird. I don't know. Oh, you know what? I think there's somebody record that did it on YouTube. Uh, let's see if I can find it. But it kind of has a foo uh, uh, Goo Goo Dolls kind of vibe to it, which is cool, right? Um, I wrote, I wrote worship with an, an S instead of a... Uh, oh, you know who did it? Is, uh, do, do I have that version? Come on, where's my window? Weird. Why are you not playing? It must be the. Oh no, that's why. Duh, my speakers are off. Yeah. So a church, a friend of mine, his church did it. So I, I can send it to you. I do it pretty slow. Um, and yeah, you know that would not be a bad example. So we're talking about harmony, okay? A, a horse with no name, two chords. A glory to God in the highest is two chords. Um, and it's really just two sections. Uh, that's why Candy and Jonathan, they kind of wanted a bridge because they felt like it was a little short. Um, but there's the hook right there. And I use the hook as the, as the verse. Yeah, a USB mic is totally fine for recording one guitar. 100%. I mean, anything to get you started. Is it is it superior quality to a, a, a signal path of Neve and a $5,000 microphone? Of course not. But does it does it capture what you need to capture? Uh, uh, YouTube admin, <laughs> I love your name. It, you could... Um, 
Um, you could, um, I, I kid you not, I have some of the young pop writers um, that I write with, they tell me, no, don't record it with a microphone, record it with your iPhone. So I have to set up my iPhone so it's kind of in front of my guitar, okay? I have to run click to my ear so I know I'm in time, and I have to, I have to counter click so they know where the beat is. Uh, because I have to hit start on this. Where, where if I'm recording the logic, I can have it start exactly on the downbeat. Like the file will drop in and it'll lock. They need something that they can go one, two, three, bump. You know, one, two, three, four, play. Start playing. Uh, it's kind of a pain because then if I mess up, I have to hit start over again and everything. Um, I can't punch in. Uh, but they love the sound of the compression of the iPhone. Um, and it kind of it, the, something about the way the iPhone records is perfect for some pop context for acoustic guitar. So yeah, yeah, that would totally work fine. <laughs> he is the boss here. Yeah, I hope so. Hi, YouTube. <laughs> Thank you for all you do for me. Um, so yeah, Josh, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to get it. Yeah. Cause we're getting to that planning stage. Shepard used to do it. Um, you may have been here when Shepard, you may have been at Shepard when we did it. If I was leading worship at Christmas time, I did it. Um, <clears throat> and I, I can send you the chord chart. I mean, I, I may have a chart for it somewhere. Hey, Bob L, tuning in. Oh, no, I saw you. Um, I think, Josh, I think, do you. Do you follow me on Instagram? You can send me your, uh, I'll follow you on Instagram. Uh, you can send me your email on Instagram and then I'll try to, I'll try to figure out some ways to send it to you. Okay. Um, break like the wind. <laughs> Final tap. Okay. Um, let's see. I'll tell you another lyric, a title, song title hook. Uh, uh, well, there's a lot of them uh, in country music, right? I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Um, you know you're going to like that song, maybe. <laughs> or you know you're going to hate that song. Uh, Disco Duck. It's like Rick Dees had a hit in the 70s with Disco Duck. And um, you, you probably didn't have to hear the song to know that you were going to hate it. <laughs> I mean, you got, who doesn't hate ducks and disco? And so Disco Duck, you know, it's just a double negative, so... Oh, you predict. Oh, Lena's making a prediction. All right. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I wonder how long it takes for that plaque to show up. I know my. I got plaque on my teeth right now. Um, let's see. Let me refresh this page and see if I've got any new subscribers in the last forty-five minutes. I've got two new subscribers in the last. Uh, what time is it? One hour. So two subscribers an hour, that's 50 a day. 50 a day would be 1,500 a month. So I don't think I'm going to get 1,500 a month. I was I was getting like 3,000 a month there for a while. It's crazy. At the beginning of last year, remember, I was at 60,000 or something, right? Um, yeah, voice memos. They used to have, um, I, uh, voice memos is what they, they use. They used to have um, something called music memos, which would add drums and bass to it. If you've ever messed with it, unfortunately, they took it off the phone, so you don't have it anymore. But that, yeah, that's all they want is they want you to use voice memos. I kid you not, it's it was crazy. So I, so what I would do is I would do both, which made it even more complex. I would go ahead and do both, and then I would send them the files of the quality ones in case the producer goes to, to the songwriting kid goes, uh, yeah, no, no, we're not, <laughs> we're not going to use the iPhone audio. We're going to use this really high quality microphone, that, you know, because uh, because you can always compress it and EQ it to make it sound like an iPhone, but not quite. It won't be exactly. And it is kind of a vibe. So yeah, 35 a day. Yeah, 35 a day. If I average 35 a day, that would be 52. Days. Okay. All right. Lena's got the math down there. Um, uh, but here's another thing. Like, uh, let me talk about, uh, like, orchestration. I said one guitar could be a song. You know, there are lots of songs, even hits on the radio. Uh, 
uh, was guitar and trumpet was uh, basically electric guitar and trumpet. Everybody thought it was acoustic, but that was electric guitar. Um, yeah, uh, Lena, what's interesting, uh, Lena has asked, I wish someone would help me with my English lyrics. Do you know that if someone translates lyrics to another language, uh, technically, I think they get put down as a co-writer. Um, I'm not mistaken. Uh, because, because oftentimes when you're translating from, say, Spanish to English, you have to, you have to, there's certain things that don't translate. And so you have to be creative to translate them, or you have to restate something, or, you know, or there may be a saying, like, I, I always tell people that when, when we're writing lyrics, never, um, uh, always, no, <laughs> sorry, that's from, what's that from, oh, that's from Steve Martin, uh, he, yeah, I climbed the mountain and went to the, saw the, the Buddha, the, 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 the guy at the top of the mountain, and he said, he told me this one thing, and I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. He said, always, no, never. <laughs> it's classic Steve Martin. Um, now I forgot what I was saying. Oh, um, yeah, certain, I, I always tell, when you're writing lyrics, don't use a cliche, okay? Don't say, um, I'll paint your wagon red or whatever the saying is. I'll paint your wagon. Because um, uh, it, it does, A, it's not, that's not being creative. You're just using someone else's saying. Secondly, um, it doesn't translate um, in, into other languages. When I was traveling, um, in, when I was touring Japan and everybody in the band had to give their testimony, I, I, I did not use any colloquialisms, as they say. Um, I didn't use any, I tried to avoid anything that says something in my hair, is it a spider? <laughs> You'll let me know if there's a spider crawling around my head, okay? <laughs> Um, but they're <laughs> still looking for it. I'm like, where the heck did that little bugger go? Um, but yeah, I tried not to use anything that couldn't be translated into Japanese by a translator. Um, and the translator came to me and said, man, you were the easiest person I've ever had to translate. You, you, you kept it really simple. And, um, and um, I did talk about McDonald's, but there were McDonald's everywhere in Japan. So they, she said, actually, as soon as you said McDonald's, you had them in the palm of your hand. <laughs> They love McDonald's in Japan. I said, really? There you go. There's a lyric. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, oh, well, shoot. In, in that, you know, we haven't talked about this one. Um, groove, tempo, rhythm. All in there. You know, again, these could be, we could group these. Okay. But meter. Right. Um, so let me put that in there with groove tempo. And meter is, is it going to be 4-4? Four, four? You know, we, we most of everything we hear is 4-4, four, four, but not everything. You'd be surprised. There's a lot of 6-8 out there. And you can think of 6-8 sometimes as a 4-4 four, four thing. But 6-8 would be like a... That's six, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, four, five, six, one. So that's a pretty common groove. Um, waltzes are three, four, three, four. Now that's that's a corny waltz. It's kind of more of a um papa. That would again, waltz would be a genre as well as a meter. Um, uh, a lot of, um, but a lot of flamenco music's in three, four, or six, eight. Um, it sometimes goes back and forth between three, four, and six, eight. Have you ever heard this groove before? Let's see. Um, no, see. I, I know it's something. I want to live in America. That's uh, called a Canarios, and that's six, eight. A bar of six eight and a bar of three four. Try to write a song in that. That's a fun, fun group. Um, a worship song in in, can, in a Canaros would be actually really really fun. I think I think I think church would love that. Uh, Gypsy Kings use the Canaros a lot. 
um, very common, like I said, very cam common in flamenco music, uh, Spanish music. Um, I'm trying to remember. There was a classical piece that ca called Canarios. So that's where I learned it from. But um, Wreck of it, Edmund Fitzgerald's in 6-8. Yeah, so there, there's definitely precedent for um, for um, pop songs, radio hits to be in 6-8, 3-4 a little bit. 6-8 is more common, um, and 4-4 four, four is obviously by far the number one meter. So that's another factor. But orchestration could be one guitar. It could be guitar-based drums. It could be two guitar, electric guitars-based drums. It could be, <laughs> look at like, Yes, the band Yes, you've got keyboard, guitar, bass, drums, vocals, obviously. Um, uh, but it, it, an orchestration comes into play in kind of in the area of production where, and again, in production, I could break that down into multiple, multiple. And a lot of times the producer will determine the key, the tempo, things like that, the, the groove. The producer might come in and say, no, no, we need to do this feel or something like that because he, he knows what the artists want, so whatever. Um, uh, but uh, orchestration could be an orchestra. It could be an 85-piece orchestra. Um, uh, Beethoven was famous for adding, increasing the size of the orchestra. Um, I think Stravinsky did the same thing, where the, you know, the, the, or, the orchestra they inherited was 60 piece, and when they, by the time they finished, they died, it was 85 pieces or whatever, you know. Um, so yeah, it, it can be crazy. Um, <laughs> oh, it's on your exercise. Uh, let's see. Tennessee Waltz, of course. Every waltz is 3-4. Yeah, that's pretty much a good. It'd be funny to write a song called Tennessee Waltz and make it 4-4. Four, four. Um, I was just uh, playing for, uh, Walter was here the other day, and I was playing for him the song Pyramid by Radiohead. And it's um, it's in 4-4, four, four, but it's like dotted quarter, dotted quarter, and then a quarter note tied to a quarter note, then dot a quarter, dot a quarter, and it repeats that. But then the chords change in weird spots. Um, and so it has this feeling that it's like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. What is it? I'm just going to play one chord, I think. That's the rhythm. So you're tempted to go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one. You could think of it that way, but that would be confusing. It's really one, two, and four. It's like a clave. That's a clave beat. Okay, in, in Brazilian music, you'll have a clave actually play a beat like that. Uh, so bump, bump, bump. So um, that's it's interesting. The Radiohead actually took a clave beat and made it the, the rhythm of the chord progression. Um, that song's called I think that's called Pyramids. Um, the uh, so uh, so I want I want to do uh, do something here. Let's let me create a new. Um, I'm going to give you some chords to play around with. Okay, we're we're gonna. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, G, we're going to be in the key of G. We're going to G, A minor, B minor, C, D, E minor. And it may be D over F sharp or something, okay? So this, we're in the key of G. And um, if you need to, you can write these down. I can write them down here. Well, you, you, got, you get the gist. Um, would you put tuning uh, of a guitar under orchestration? Well, it's not covered by any of those others. Let me think. Uh, possibly, yeah, I would consider that orchestration. Because one of the things that orchestration does is if, if I'm playing guitar for a song, okay, um, who asked that? Oh, Steve. Yeah, Steve. Steve always asks good questions. Um, but if I play guitar in a song, my in its standard tuning, my range is predetermined. The lowest note I can hit is E, right? 
Uh, and the highest note I could hit is this, but I'm not going to hit that. You know, probably D, maybe this A, or something like that. But my range is predetermined unless I'm capoing. Um, so if I add a bass player, I just lowered. If a bass is a, five, a standard four string bass and he's tuned to low note as E, now I have an octave below that. So now my range, and I guess you could put that in there uh, as another, you know, but range is usually orchestration. So a flute has a range that's very high. So if you if you orchestrate a section of music that's only flutes, you're, you will only be able to go so low. And if you have flutes and tuba, you might not have anything in between, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so I would say that if I go to drop D, Not only is it going to affect how I write um, on the instrument, it's going to affect the range, and it might might predetermine the key that I'm going to play in. I'm probably if I'm in drop D, I'm probably going to do a song in the key of D because you know. And I, I've told you this before. One of the things you do if you're doing it playing in drop D, like acoustically, don't don't share that note for a while. Save it, okay? Like this. I'm doing six eight. Maybe the first man I go to the course. Then you bring it in, right? That gives you, uh, that comes under dynamics. Uh, and that's another element of songwriting. If you write a song and it's the same dynamics all the way through, nobody's going to want to listen to it. Not more than once. <laughs> like I said, worship songs tend to take it to the extreme and they tend to do too many dynamics. But, um, yeah, because I you can't work. Oh, we're, oh, are we buffering? Dang it. Um, I, there, Alan, there's just no good way to work in F sharp diminished. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I, I, I've used... I could use it in a jazz context, but yeah, it's not common. So if you if you want to have a way to use that leading chord, uh, D over F sharp, I think is stronger than F sharp diminished, in my opinion. But you can use in your song, you can use F sharp diminished if you want. I just didn't want to. I didn't want to tie anyone to that. Now you don't have to use all of these chords in your chord progression. And I would try to come up with four different. Well, I would try to come up with a verse and a chorus, maybe two different chord progressions. In pop music, you would just do the same progression for the whole thing. That's changing, by the way. Uh, pop music's getting a little bit, not not that Rick Beato would notice yet, but um, it, I, at my end, they're asking for more than just a, a loop, okay? Um, and so, uh, but like a pop song might be uh, like uh, C to, we're in the kitchen, so it might be... Now, what's what would be a good pop progression? Uh, so I'm going G, D to, to uh, E minor. Uh, sorry, I'm going G to D to E minor to C, and then sometimes I could use that F sharp. Yeah, yeah. It, this D over F sharp works better harmonically. D over F sharp's in the key. Um, and you could put, you could do any inversion of any of these song chords if you want. You could play C over E. I might do. Uh, I got the E in the bass there over the C chord, so it's C over E. To G to D over F sharp. That's another potential chord progression. Um, using these chords. So yeah, you can you can change, you could play uh, A minor over G to D over F sharp if you want, something like that. So yeah, you can put anything. These are just basic, the basic harmony in the key of G. The one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the leading five chord. Uh, but a, a diminished would sound like, uh, let's see, I don't, even, I don't even play diminished chords. I mean, I play diminished seventh. But it's there. That wouldn't be. That wouldn't work. Um, uh, I guess nope. That's a seventh. Uh, let's see. Hilarious. Yeah. So it'd be like. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, like I said, I would. Yeah, it was, oh, okay. So, yeah, so they'll be like a D7 over F sharp, I guess would be technically a diminished, F sharp diminished. Uh, but I just don't ever use that chord. If somebody, I rarely see diminished chords by themselves. Usually they have sevenths. I wrote a worse. It started on a diminished chord, which is unusual. Um, and that was a worship song I wrote back in the 90s. A very James Taylor kind of vibe. Or uh, Eric Clapton. But John Mayer liked this song a lot, and that's what got him started playing guitar. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Imagine, and maybe it predates John Mayer. Um, yeah, F sharp A C is an F sharp diminished. So it, I mean, it creates tension, and we tension is good. Tension release is all, all, all kind of can be, and tension can be created by any of these. Okay, uh, the groove can create tension. Meter, you can use meter. You can change meter in the middle of a song to create tension. Your harmony can definitely change, create tension. Now, so it's like, whoa, what the heck? Oh, thank you. That's tension and release. Uh, Tomber can, you know, rhythm, you know, you know, you can create, use rhythm to do. I don't know, but key could changing keys could create tension definitely. Um, so, you know, production, you can create tension in, in the production. Um, so yeah, and you can write, you can write in any meter. You don't have to do four, four, you can do six, eight, you can do it. But, um, here's one of the things you can try to do. Okay. First off your in initial, like if you were to play, write a song like in the fifties, you would play G E minor C D one, six, four, five. I'm, I, I keep going to three four, don't I? But that would this is almost more like six uh, twelve eight. Twelve eight and six eight are kind of the same thing. Like twelve eight is six eight double. Six eight typically kind of has more of a Irish folky feel. Twelve eight is more of like a shuffle. You you're really thinking six eight. You're kind of counting one two three four and five. Six, big two one two with subdivided threes. Twelve eight. You're usually thinking one two three four. Thank you. Lena. You're subdividing into triplets, but overall you're going. Da, da. You know that would be a, like a, a '50s thing would be in 12/8 or something. Uh, but a very common chord progression in uh, the '50s was one, six, four, five. And you can start there. We did this. Remember, we played around with this and we we made changes in it. And we go, okay, let's flip these two chords. So instead of going one, six, four, five, you can go flip the six and the four. So instead, so go one. Four, six, five, like that. Let me do it. And that could be your B section. Your A section could be one, six, four, five. And then you can go, the chorus could be. Oh, I, I got a. the original progression. See what I did? I kind of went to the four chord and sat on that for a minute. Um, I forgot song form is another is another uh, element to a song, which makes sense. All right, so is that this one? Yes. What's song form? Song form is the order of the verse, chorus, things like that. Um, I'll, I'll put an example here. A, A, B, A. That's up. Uh, not ABBA, but okay. Uh, let me drag this over a little bit. There we go. Um, Beatles did a lot of song form, a lot, a lot you know, uh, I want to hold your hand. 
So really, what's interesting about when you analyze a Beatles song and compare it to today's pop, um, really what the Beatles did was verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus, and then chorus out. Um, oh, wait, wait, what key is it? That's the A. Do you hear that? They had the, I know my singing is lame and I'm just kind of figuring out as I'm going. Um, but that was the, the A, the A contained the verse and the chorus. So it does that again, and then it does again. B minor. Typical classic Beatles fashion. We go to that that major three chord. In this case, it would be B seven. Okay, and we could add that to our list of chords here in the key of G if we wanted to, because that leads really beautifully to the C chord. And it's a certain. It's not a plagal cadence. It's one of those cadence things. And there's a name for it. I don't need to know the name. Those uh, analyzing things comes from people after you do something amazing. Let the music theory people come along and analyze your amazing music. Okay, just do whatever sounds good to you. And that's kind of what the Beatles. Did. They didn't know that that was a perfect plagal cadence or whatever the heck they, they call it. Music theory. Some people really enjoy knowing the names of things. Ah, see, it goes a minor five chord. See, we're in the... It's, that's the B section. And that it does, A, A, B, A doesn't have to stick to that because I think it goes A, A, B, A, B, A, out. I think, right? It does go back to that. I think it goes to the when I touch you, I feel happy inside. I think it goes to that um, section again. And um, <laughs> so, um, um, it, it, yeah, it goes to that. Um, it goes to that B section again, I think. But um, anyway, yeah. So, but but the but the basic song form is A A B A. Um, and you might you might notate that. I mean, I know a lot of times we do this when we go, oh, it's verse chorus, verse chorus chorus, bridge verse chorus, or bridge chorus out, or something like that, or maybe verse verse chorus, verse verse chorus. You know, V V C V V C. Yeah, that's the song form. And so you know, you you, you kind of want to you kind of want to pay attention to that too because you could you know I, I've written songs and we'll I'll be playing I'll play some of my songs but I've written songs where um the the uh I kind of painted myself into a corner um I have this song called Madeline that I love it's one of my favorite songs um uh, see I think it's, it's maybe in G that's it. it was about a rich a, a rich a woman that was so rich she couldn't trust any of the men in her lives because they, she, it was sad. It's a sad story. She could trust her cats, but not her, the men in her lives because she didn't know if they loved her for her or for her money. Um, and so the song's called Madeline. Um, we actually released it, but I don't think it's anywhere in, in, in any of the socials. Um, I'm trying to remember how it goes. Sometimes she likes what she's <laughs> I thought I saw a spider. I'm like, where are you, little spider? <laughs> the itsy bitsy spider. <laughs> That's probably public domain, right? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. We'll see. I didn't sing it well enough. And I, the tempo was, just, you know, not. I don't think I'll. I think I'll be fine if I'm just kind of half, sorry, half acidly playing. <laughs> it's. <laughs> Uh, so a friend of mine was jumping in a pool one time and I said, look at it, it's half acid. <laughs> and, he, and he just died because it sounded like half acid. 
and I, that's what I said. I said half acid, but I didn't mean half acid. I meant half acid. But um, I, I was I was playing a half acid. <laughs> I was only half on acid when I played that song, so it should be it should pass muster. If I can't monetize it, then I may cut it out. And I'll be talking about it now, and everybody will know what song. <laughs> but I was playing uh, uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand by the Beatles. And there could be several songs I have to cut out, but I, I've never gotten a, a, a copyright infringement there. It's only recorded stuff that they tend to, if I were to play the recording in here, it would cause problems. And that, like I said, when I do Where's the Hook, I think we'll we'll talk about that there. Um, that's an interesting one. It's like, um, What's the hook on that? The melody's pretty cool. That's the hook. I think that's a it's a solid melody in the chorus. That's the hook. That's what made girls call the station and go play that. I want to hold your hand song. Um, we have about five sips coming. I just touched my nose. I haven't changed guitars at all. That's one of the SIP rules if I change guitars. Um, but uh, the, um, oh, the Madeline song. Let's see. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Oh, we see Beth sing. So. Sometimes she lies. Shoot, where are the words are? Well, I bet I have them written down somewhere. Let's see what I have. I, um, let me see. Because it's this is my point is, um, but here's the song. See, I could probably play it and not get in trouble because. Sometimes she likes what she sees in the mirror as she makes herself. Sometimes she wonders if she'd hate herself if she was someone else. Yeah, it was recorded. It was there's a production thing there. It's like it was recorded in this gym. <laughs> it sounds like it, and we did it live. Yeah, it's pretty, it was pretty low for Beth. That was pretty. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Oh, it was a beat match. No. Oh, I see. I was, I was capo. Uh, sometimes she likes what she sees in the mirror. She makes us Sometimes she If she was someone else, self-esteem and a basic dream one day by power and a moment. Madeline has chronic again. If it's for sale, she'll own it. And that's the that's the first verse. And then it goes to the second verse. And the problem is my rhyming scheme painted me in a corner. I set up the most complex rhyming scheme. So it's like the lyric is, um, sometimes she likes what she sees in the mirror as she makes herself. Sometimes she wonders if she'd hate herself if she was someone else. Okay. So kind of a rhyme and then a double rhyme in the middle of a thing. And I don't remember if I use that. And then the, sec the second half of the verse is self-esteem and evasive dream. See, there's an inside rhyme. One day by hour by moment. Matter than as a chronic yet. If it's for sale, she'll own it. And then it goes uh, da, 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 the second verse. I'll have to find a lyric somewhere. Um, uh, Hold on. I think I got, I have a book of lyrics. Let me see. All the, okay. Hold that thought. Let me know if you see the spider. That was fast.
fast. I think it's in here because we performed it recently, and I'm, I have to keep this because um, oh, here it is. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a, a lyric. I mean, look how dense these lyrics are. Oh, can you see that? Ah, yeah, there's a lot of lyrics. And so I got about halfway through the song, and it took me forever to finish it because it was just hard to, to once I set up that rhyming scheme. Sometimes she likes what she sees in the mirror when she makes herself, or as she makes herself. Sometimes she wonders if she'd hate herself if she were someone else. Now, did, I don't think that herself, I don't think that is a, So those are just two rhymes at the end of the phrases. And then self-esteem and evasive dream one day by hour by moment. And Madeline has a chronic yen. If it's for sale, she'll own it. It's like, whoa. <laughs> and then the second verse is, uh, In a 32 mansion, she talks to her cat and says, The poor are lucky, for they still think money can buy Actually, the poor are lucky for they still think. So there's a rhyme there too. It's like crazy. So the, the second verse is, and we're not, I mean, we talk about lyrics um, and I would craft lyrics. I mean, I was a man, I was, my lyrics were like, I really tried to make every word count. Um, yeah, this is paper, but I, I've got it written down somewhere. I, I, it's in computer somewhere. Obviously I had to print it. So. Uh, but in her 32 room mansion, she talks to her cat and says, the poor are lucky, for they still think money can buy happiness. Uh, the, the cat replies with open eyes, but and ears that are not hearing. And as the norm, she's kept warm by her wealth, and it is searing. So the lyric there is, the cat replies with open eyes and ears that are not hearing. And as the norm, she's, she's kept warm by her wealth, and it is serious. I'm laughing because that rhyming scheme, I'm like, what did I do? And I, I, I managed to actually get two more verses with that rhyming scheme. So it's like a line with a rhyme, line with a word at the end, line with a word at the end. And those are the first two lines. And the next two lines are inside rhyme, li rhyme at the end, inside rhyme, and rhyme at the end. Like, what was I thinking? I, what was I thinking? It's a very Elvis. Yes, Gary, you're spot on because I was a huge Elvis fan. And in fact, the kind of the way I'm singing it right now um, kind of betrays that. Um, now, let's see if I can remember the chorus. The chorus is high. It's high. Um, but um, uh, what's the chorus? Let's see. Great lyric. I mean, I'm sorry. I, this is a this is a really nice song. I probably should re-record this. Maybe make this one of my releases. I wouldn't sing it. I would have Beth or someone else sing it. But she might say, "I'll fly away." And to another inside rhyme there. And she might, she might, she might say, "I love that major seven too." She might say, And then I'm playing, singing the F sharp over the C chord, Fly away. which is the the sharp four. And she that spider where? <laughs> ah, hopefully it wasn't a flying spider. But she man, this is embarrassing. You can watch this over and over again. And no, no one will take notice. I mean, I really. Not only did I pay attention to the lyrics, I really pay attention to the melody. The chords were... I'm going 5-1-4-1, one, one, which is kind of interesting to start the chorus on the 5 chord. But she might away, no one will take notice. Another man, another man will kiss her hand. So another man will kiss her hand, and she'll know not love but motive. Oh, that's, those are brutal lyrics. And I don't even remember the inspiration for this. I think that maybe I read an article on Dylan writing song stories about people. And I go, oh, I'll write about a song. And I just came up with Madeline. 
In fact, oh, sometimes, uh, does it even say Madeline? Oh, every Sunday, Madeline. Yeah. Um, I don't, oh, no, and Madeline has a chronic end. Yeah, so it says Madeline in the first verse. Um, so, so the second, or the third verse, so, so now I, that's two verses, and it's like, it was it was like working in a freaking stone yard breaking up rock to, to write this song. I remember, um, uh, I remember. Um, <laughs> you want to sing it too? Um, the uh, uh, I remember um, uh, writing this and just just going what? And then Beth is in the other room and she's listening to me work on this and. I, I, I'm just like, oh man, I'm just like, me, I'm cussing myself out because I, I, I wrote, created this rhyming scheme that I had to stick to because I really love this song, especially the hook. I mean, once I go, and she might The telly was her family, a harlequin, her true romance. In her life, she's been a wife, she's tasted fruits of passion. The vows she thought that he would, or that he forgot, were just victims of new fashion. So there's that, that's a great lyric too, you know, a heritage of royalty, an orphan of her circumstance. The telly was her family, television, uh, a harlequin, her true romance. Um, in her life, she's been a wife. She's tasted fruits of passion. The vows she thought that he forgot were just victims of new fashion. Again, lyrics writing is not something I've done in a long time because through all of this, uh, I never had any success. And all these songs, all these records that Beth and I released, uh, I think we did three records, um, we probably started a fourth, and we had uh, enough material for five records, maybe six. Um, we never, I never, we were never in the black on any of them. They always cost more money than they made. Um, and we would play out. We did, especially before Emma was born. Well, Jack and Alex were young. We were still doing gigs and playing shows and stuff. But eventually, it just kind of it got too difficult to do with babysitters and scheduling things and stuff. So. Um, uh, but it, but when I started to get successful writing and I say successful, I mean, my wife says I'm successful. I haven't had a hit. Okay. And I, I should have started the whole, <laughs> this whole two hour stream with, I've never had a hit. Uh, but I've written with a lot of pop artists. Um, I've written, you know, like I said, I've got probably written 40 songs with Justin Bieber, um, which is pretty crazy. Um, and I think I've had five released, maybe six. And a bunch of them leaked. But in those scenarios, see, the thing is, because of my age um, and because of where I'm from demographically uh, on the timeline, it's difficult for me to write a melody and a lyric that's relevant to young people today. OK, but the basis, the chord structure, the harmony, the guitar parts or whatever, that kind of stuff I don't have a problem doing. And everybody seems to like what I do. And I'm not even doing throwback stuff. I'm trying to do stuff that sounds like tomorrow. Um, so. So I don't I don't really. Um, so I, I'm, I don't I'm not bummed that I didn't have I, I, I'm just thrilled to have any success that I'm having. Um, <laughs> but I'm a hit with you guys. Um, but yeah, Gary, you nailed it with it. With, this is very, so it comes, and I love that in her life, she's been a wife. In her life, she's been a wife. She's tasted, there's a deal, Brad Sharp. Fruits of passion, four, one over, is the first version one chord, eight minor two chord, one chord, and then she goes to the chorus. And she makes Another melody uh, thing. I just she, she might say, say fly, fly away, and no, no one will take notice. So I, I no 
chord is, I anticipate the B note for the G chord. So I'm playing, singing the major seventh over the C. It breaks down. Every Sunday, Madeline is met by friends who play their parts. A curator, <laughs> a curator. Never thought I'd put the word curator in a, a curator. Uh, yeah, it's a hard word to sing. A young playwright and other patrons of the arts. An open hand has Madeline. It's not that she's not giving. But she didn't ask, you must realize She's no way to make a living Yeah, it's a sad song. Written in 1990. That song is 31 years old. Uh, wouldn't, would, how funny would it be if I recorded it and somehow it became like a giant meme hit? Oh no, we're buffering, sorry. Yeah, I'm an older. <laughs> yeah, choose that. Or so you think I am. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's a it's a yeah it's a sad song. I but like I said, I would man, I would put. Um, uh, I I ran across a Buddy Miller song. Keep your distance. Really good song. Um. Um, yeah, I have a song called Fuel. How much of the... This is a great... I, I love this song, too. Um, again, these are all mostly Beth's keys, but... Uh, and oftentimes, I really would... Really would... Um, oh, thank you, Leon. I'll, I'll put it on... A, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll put a folder in here in my... Project folder. If I just add the folder and I go, Madeline, I'll put... Australia record here. I'll put because I put friends in there, which is one uh, Madeline, and not far from where I stand, which I've done before for you guys. That's the one that's. Uh, uh, see, without that perception, but I could always see the souls of men We're shackled by quiet desperation, empty and falling vessels of torment. But thanks for stranger it took the time Time lost a toll on me and mine Taking time and not giving it back Taking time and not giving it back So that's, that's a, I was born without depth perception <laughs> Or no, that song's called Not Far From Where I Stand But everybody calls it not, uh, I was born with Yeah, let's see, how much uh, I have to listen to the record to find this one Yeah, the lyric on this one is called, this one's called Fuel. We complain of a world that's cruel and ignore all the hate that we hate to admit we fuel. How powerful is that a lyric, huh? Uh, just like a mirror, really, oh, that one also, um, that one is about sharing your faith, just like a mirror is. I was born without depth perception. I guess that is the name I kept with it. Happy, I have a song called Happy. That's <laughs> funny. Uh, 2,000 Miles, which was about... That one's really, well, it says 94, but I wrote that about being engaged and being 2,000 miles apart from uh, um, your betrothed. Um, yeah, so, you know, I will definitely be doing, um, uh, you know, my songs in here to kind of model, or to model how I thought, because I know, those, in those scenarios, I, I know how I thought. I know how I created them, so. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Springsteen would definitely write a lot of lyrics. Dylan would write a lot of lyrics. He thought he would run out of words, I'm sure. But when, when you joke, oh, until Dylan joked. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. I remember um, talking to, uh, there's a worship leader named Tommy Walker who wrote a lot of worship songs, and he, and he, 
we were having lunch one time and he was like, I can't figure out why my worship songs aren't doing better on CCLI. Aren't, more churches aren't recording them. And I said, dude, your songs are too hard. Uh, you know, the B section, I mean, the bridges on your songs are like, what? And they're jazzy and all this stuff. And, and he's like, really? And I go, well, yeah, I mean, LA guys and New York guys can play it, but nobody else. I mean, I've been all, I'm from Indiana. And, you know, I, nobody else in the rest of the country can play those chords. I don't know what those chords are. And so then he, <laughs> the, like he wrote something, so, uh, that's why we praise him. It was like, rock song and F, you know, three chords. And, uh, that was his like the biggest song ever. And then he did, um, he knows my name, which is, uh, um, which is, uh, probably five, six chords, basically in D it's funny. Cause him, Tommy, Tommy, you know, a worship songwriter, he was working on a song <laughs> and he had the, he had the chart up on his music stand and he had a friend over who wasn't a Christian, didn't go to church, didn't know anything like that. And the song was called Great I Am. <laughs> and he thought, he, when he saw that, he thought, man, this guy's an egomaniac. He's writing a song called Great I Am. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty. Oh, man. You know, inspiration is another thing. I mean, gosh, I, I, I mean, I could throw inspiration in there because it almost be the first thing on this list. Um, I'm going to put it down here. Inspiration isn't necessarily something that's, Part of a song, but it it, it can it can incre you know create the it, it can be the ultimate impetus for the song. I mean, again, remember I said music songwriting can be therapy, um, and if you struggle with self esteem issues or if you struggle with depression, you know this could be one of the best live streams we've ever done because um, because it, it it could definitely touch on, uh, help you kind of vomit some of that stuff out, get it out. Um, and, and you don't want to get too personal, <laughs> uh, you know, but I mean, well, you know, I killed a man in Memphis, maybe <laughs> you could do it. You could finally confess that, you know, um, get that out, you know, out of there. Oh, wait, I thought I saw the spider. Where is he? Yeah. Dang it. We got a theme. We got a theme for this episode. Um, Spider on my wall could be a lyric. We're gonna. I, I'm gonna try to give you some. Um, uh, uh, you know, lyric challenges. Um, I have a song uh, called "Yellow Lights" that was just something that I, I challenged myself to write a song about. The I, I came up with the title first, and then I wrote a song from there. Okay. People ask me all the time, "What do you write first, chords, lyrics, or or?" I, it, it 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 just depends Chord, you know you got melody chords lyrics we're gonna do, right now i'm asking you to come up with the chord um and with the chords you might come up with the groove or the feel or the tempo or the rhythm and you'll come up with the groove the meter all of those things the genre all that stuff might be all discovered in the process of coming up with the chord progression okay let's say you do that that we could do that you know the the one six four five progression okay Six, eight. Okay, kind of a Celtic feel. But if I did the stop, if I just play on the upbeats or a reggae. The death metal. Uh, you know, you can do what? Uh, so, so genre, all, all of that could be wrapped up in the in in, in the um, in the harmony. So, when you're creating the harmony, when you're coming up with your chord progression, that just something, to, just something will click. You know, just go, just start playing the chords randomly. Go. That's just four, two, three, and I don't think I've ever really heard anything like that. Maybe I could go to that.
you change it up a little bit. There's your, and write it down, you know, have it. But the other thing is you don't have to change chords every time in on, on one, three, or one and one, you know. You could go, say one, two. So I'm, I keep getting, I'm, for some reason I just got three, four in my head. Uh, uh, let's see. That would be just nothing wrong with this. Okay, but if like if I were in an R and B band or a horn band, you might play that progression. It might be more like you might push those chord changes because you got horns to put. You know, if you've got horn section, you're like, oh wait a minute, if I got a horn section, it'd be stupid to go. Nigel, da, 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 root melody, oh, oh, it's intertwining lines. So, but if you if you got horns, you, you're almost if you're in a horn band, you're probably going to do a lot of pushes, and that means pushing things on the and of four and the and of two, or uh, sometimes on the sixteenth note. Uh, but, it would change. It would change how you. Played those chords and you could do the same melody over those two chords see the melody may be the same over all the genres um, you know teen spirit <laughs> this is one of the best melodies ever written Kurt Cobain was one of the is literally one of the best songwriters because his song I heard that elevator music I heard it in an elevator and I didn't know what song it was for the I'm sitting there going what the heck song is that? that's a great melody and it was oh my gosh it's Nirvana I remember I heard when doves cry I was at Sizzler I never go to Sizzler. And I went to Sizzler and they were playing Muzak. And uh, I think Ted Nugent bought the company that does Muzak. If I'm not mistaken, I think he bought that company. I, some, there's a vague memory of a story I read about something like that. Bye, Gary. Yeah, I hope this is a lot of fun. You can tell I'm passionate about it. Um, and uh, I, I think I think we're going to, we're going to, we're going to find, um, hopefully we're going to come out with some songs on this. You know, we'll, we'll have something. So, um, and, uh, if you want to do the homework, Holly, you could probably, um, transcribe all of Madeline just from this video. <laughs> Cause I think I sang the entirety of the song. And if you want to record it go for it, um, uh, I have to, it's all copyrighted and everything. It's all with BMI. I need, but but yeah, it would be nice to. That might that would be a good one to re record. I don't know. It's the fun. The interesting thing about that song is, the production wise, I'm I'm hearing it as being pretty up tempo. You know, almost sounds like almost sounding like a fun song. <clears throat> but yeah, Kurt Cobain was very troubled, um, and a lot of what he wrote was therapy. Um, a lot of what he wrote was his. He was writing about his ghosts and demons, right? Um, and, uh, unfortunately it didn't, it didn't end well for him. Um, it, I, you know, I think, well, heroin was the monkey on his back was his biggest problem. And so fame may have brought that upon him, but to be honest, I think he was doing heroin before he was famous. Clearly you don't have to be rich to do heroin because, <laughs> uh, let's see if I've got any new subscribers here. Oh, five more subscribers. Wow. Since I last checked, no, that's pretty crazy. Hmm. Maybe it'll happen. 98,225. We got a countdown clock here going. Right, Bruce? Bruce is on it. Um, let's see. Oh, as a kid. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, uh, Billy Armstrong from... Um, uh, Green Day. 
Um, also, um, Jimmy World. Uh, I can't think of the main songwriter for Jimmy World. They write. I'm a. I'm always been a fan of power pop. I remember the Knack, uh, My Sharona. I thought they should have been bigger than they were. I thought they, you know, they because they wrote some really good power pop songs, but they just didn't. I don't know what it was. Maybe they weren't like ready for the MTV, um, you know, era. Um, I'm not sure, but um, there we go. Um, but yeah, it's power pop is one of those things where I really dug. Um, like I said, I've always always liked uh, Elvis Costello. Um, I love Burt Bacharach, one of the best melody writers um, ever. I mean, just great melodies. Uh, Burt Bacharach and Check it out. Um, I think it's called Akron, Ohio. Well, let me look it up. Um, uh, whoops. Uh, Painted from Memory is the name of the album. Bert Elvis uh, Costello did an album with uh, Burt Bacharach, and it's actually it's two of my favorite songwriters. And I'm like, part of me is thinking, how is this going to work? And, you know, what's it going to be? And I went ahead and bought it. I wasn't sure. And it actually really good. So nothing became a hit. Um, I think they performed them. I, a friend of mine, she sings backgrounds for Elvis. Um, um, I think, yeah, uh, yeah she, I think she's still on the, well, I mean, if anybody's on the road. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Please, yeah, hit the like button if you want to. <laughs> what are we what are we at likewise what do we got 40 not bad and and, and uh, uh lena thank you so much for the ten dollars that really means a lot i watch rick beato and it's just amazing i'm like dang dude you should just live stream all day <laughs> That's, if i would do, if i were getting that kind of you guys would see me non-stop if i just saw five dollars five dollars five dollars five dollars twenty dollars five dollars fifteen dollars a dollar Six cents, five dollars. If I saw that all day long, well, or the whole time I was streaming, I was, why would I ever leave the stream? You know, this is funny. Um, yeah, and so um, yeah, you don't. We're not talking about releasing. Although, if you feel like you want to, there's no reason why you can't. If you get a good recording of it, you like it, you're happy with it. Why not put it up on C CD Baby? You can release a song for ten bucks. I mean, it doesn't cost a lot of money to get a song up on streaming. Um, it has to be original. Um, you can't, I wouldn't use, uh, the, we're talking about being creative and writing and stuff. So I would not use any, uh, you can use loops if they're from a loop library, but I wouldn't use, uh, samples. Just avoid that. Avoid the hip hop thing of using samples. So you don't have to deal with permissions or splits or any of that kind of stuff. That just adds a whole nother level. Whenever I write anything with any pop artists, I have to sign a contract saying I didn't use any samples. Um, as a producer, and um, I never do. I'm the I'm the one they're sampling, so it's original with me. So, okay, Jack, no worries. Take off. Oh, Chris, Chris, yeah, Chris Christopherson wrote great lyrics too. Yeah. Um, so uh, another one that I really love was uh, Jimmy Webb. Jimmy Webb's a great songwriter, and he was a great songwriter at like 19 years old. He wrote um, like all of Glenn Campbell's hits, Galveston. Uh, Wichita Lyman's a beautiful song, but he wrote everything. But like the Wichita, and I've seen Jimmy Webb live, and uh, um, but Wichita Lyman, great melodies, uh, you know, great sentiment, kind of sad. Um, <laughs> well, who knows? <laughs> uh, who knows what, who wants to hear hear uh, your songs? You know, everybody, you'd be surprised what there's a market for out there. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't have to go to any uh, certain websites to realize there's all sorts of tastes out there. <laughs> Need I say more? Yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see. Um, I mean, if I, I'll, I'll probably think of some more song elements, but we'll, we'll add to this. Um, try to come up with some couple progressions between now and next Monday. Um, write them down or, or just note them, you know, um, you can add sevenths to these. You don't need to make a major chord. You can do whatever you want to them. Um, you, again, that's another classic thing. If you add that's, that would come under, uh, well, a rain. Oh, you know what? 
you know what? Um, there's another term here that we're missing, and that's arrangement. Um, it it it's kind of a cross between orchestration and song form. Like an arranger might come along and go add two bars after the first chorus um, going into the verse. Whereas the songwriter, the writer might have originally just had one verse. I mean, go right into it. But the orchestrator may go, no, I want the strings to come in and do this something. Uh, so that would be an arrangement. Uh, so arrangement could be the song form, but arrangement could also be like, um, and again, orchestration, arrangement, song form, they all kind of go together. I should probably put them together. Um, let me move that. Uh, let me move. So I'm going to take song form and move it up there with the other. Okay. They're kind of very closely related, almost synonymous, but not maybe quite. Not quite. And, you know, an arranger technically will sometimes get. Um, um, if it's a public domain piece, like I did a, an arrangement of Amazing Grace for the Mentalist, and um, it was Amazing Grace is a public domain piece, um, but uh, let's see. Um, sorry, brain is working on other stuff now. Um, <clears throat> but the, the uh, sorry, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> I, I write on piano. I used to write a lot on piano. Um, I don't think I have my piano up right now. It's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird sounding piano. Um, I'm trying to think of a song that I wrote on piano. I, I have one. That's a really dark piano. I think I'll go to this one. Um, but yeah, we had a piano in my house growing up as a kid. Um, it's technically my piano and I had to sell it when my mom, uh, we sold her house cause I didn't have room for, I didn't have the house yet. If I'd had the house, I might've moved it out to California, but it needed a ton of work. Poor piano. It was an old Steinway from, I think it was a 1903 or 1902 Steinway parlor grands. It was six and a half feet black, beautiful piano. Uh, but it was um, when I went home to, and played it, it was so out of tune. The strings needed to be replaced. It needed new pins. It needed the soundboard was cracked in four places. Um, I actually priced getting it worked on. And if I wanted to have Steinway do the repair, they would literally. Um, in fact, the, the, the finish, the body had chips out of it. They would refinish it, put new strings, felts, pads. And actually replace the hammers and everything. The keys would be replaced. It had ebony and ivory keys, um, and they would replace them with fake eb eb uh, fake ivory keys because uh, they can't traffic in ivory keys. And I'm like, well, what happens to ivory keys? Because I would have loved to have kept them because um, I actually have a piece of ivory that I use as a guitar pick. It actually sounds pretty good as uh, from a an old piano that I you know at a junkyard that I broke a piece off and said, hey, cool guitar pick. But um, the uh, yeah, I had to. I, I sold it for next to nothing, but it was going to cost forty thousand dollars to have Steinway refurb it. Okay, they still make this piano. I think it's a Model C, and uh, they go for eighty-five to ninety-five thousand. So technically, and it would be like a brand new piano when they were done with it. Um, so, but there'd be so little left of it. It wouldn't be like my grand. It was my grandmother's piano, and then my mom got it, and then she gave it to me. Um, yeah, that was Let It Be. Um, that was, let it be is C, G, so one, five, six, four, 
very common chord progression. Um, yeah, yeah, and so I think Discord's going to be a great place where you guys can upload your your attempts at writing, um, and we can even just like you know we can start we can start with a a chorus, uh, come up with a chorus idea. I'll tell you, I struggle. I it's a struggle, um, especially now when I'm collaborating. In fact, I've just worked. I, I've got to do something with Kelly. Uh, we're trying to write a Christmas song, which is, man, talk about difficult. That's almost impossible to write a Christmas song, because um, what is intrinsically Christmas about a melody or a chord production? It's it's all the pressure is on the lyrics and on the production and it just means playing <laughs> having having sleigh bells it's like yeah i'm not gonna put sleigh bells on <laughs> the song just because it's a christmas song so i sent her an idea that i had and uh and and at first she struggled with it and then she came up with something and it turned out really good i <laughs> so but she wants to speed it up so i've got to re-record it at a new tempo <clears throat> and when she's going to She's going to put it up on her Patreon and all that stuff. So we'll, we'll figure something out. But we, we, we were going to do a cover, and then she said, well, why don't we just do something original that we can monetize? And, and I'm like, yeah, let's do that. Um, I'm totally fine, fine with that. And she does – she's an actress, and she does, like, Lifetime movies. She's actually done a couple Christmas Lifetime movies. And um, she's, like, the star. Like, she'll be the main female character. And um, – uh, so it, it doesn't hurt to have a couple like songs like that that we can get in the movie because she and I have gotten uh, we got a song in um, what was it uh, I'll, I'll show you uh, uh, Cry Baby is one of the songs we got oh no this is not what I want, I want actual YouTube um, in a, a Netflix movie and I mean, I think we made, you know, a thousand dollar license fee and then on the back end, we get paid every quarter or something. So, you know, it probably, probably have justified the time by now. Um, yeah, here it is. Well, it's not bad. 13,000 views on YouTube. Her, her singing the national anthem has has gotten more views <laughs> at the Rams game. She's a very good singer. This is a song we wrote. She basically wrote the top line. I wrote the kind of the, the bed of it. You know, again, it's kind of what I tend to do now as a songwriter. I work with other writers that tend to write the top lines. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so what? Let's see, what movie was she in? Um, probably airing now, which is good for her. Um, IMDb. Her name is Kelly Jekyll. It's Kelly with E Y, not Y. Um, and then Jekyll is J A K L E. Right, let's see. I mean, she she was in all the Pitch Perfect movies. She was in the singing group for that. Um, what was the name of that movie? Let's see. Okay. A Very Charming Christmas Town. That was last year. Uh, Mistletoe and Menorahs. Christmas Harmony. Uh, it's just classic. Yeah. So it's funny. She just was a nun in something. <laughs> you know, short. So it, it's... Uh, Acting thing is kind of slow right now because of co you know COVID slowed things down the production on those but I think she's in production on something else. So, uh, okay, um, so the, yeah, you can check out that um, that crybaby song. Um, I think that was my baritone. I think I played my baritone acoustic on that one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so we've written a few songs together. You know, she's got opportunities like that I don't have. And that's the beauty of co collaborating. And and trust me, I, when we, we're talking about songwriting, we're talking about how to make money on it. Okay. 
I'll show you, you know, I'll tell you what you have to do. Um, and then the collaborating thing, you know, one of the things is difficult if you're not in a major music town like LA, Nashville, um, LA, Nashville are the two big collaborating. I mean, they just Alex, you know, I, I don't do it so much. What I do is I work with producers and just send them stuff. Um, but Alex will go into rooms and he's got a manager. We'll hook him up. And so he'll set up, they'll set up, these managers will set up writing sessions with all their clients and all of their clients, you know, maybe four different people here in this one studio, they all have different skills and they all have different connections. So between all of them, um, you know, they'll all get, get the song placed with somebody. And so it's just a matter of time before Alex has a hit. Uh, I'm, I'm sure of it. Um, it's, it's, uh, where's that spider? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it would be fun. Uh, it'd be fun to post an original. And you can start posting them now if you already have the original songs. Gary, I don't know if Gary's still on. Is Gary still here? Uh, oh, no, Gary took off. Um, he he performs a lot. Um, also, Holly, you perform. Do you write ever? Have you ever written? Writing can be kind of intimidating. Um I'm, you know, I don't read poets so much. Um, I'm, I've not really gotten into that, which is funny because especially early on, I was really, in, I, I listened to a lyric heavy artist. Like, like I always felt like Elvis Costello was one of those artists or writers that wrote, was pretty lyric heavy. Um, I've never got into Dylan. Um, uh, just couldn't get past his voice. Uh, but, but it's kind of like wine with me. I envy my friends that love Dylan. Like uh, my friends that, that really are big Dylan fans are really great songwriters. They're really good. Um, they, they have interesting, you know, they, 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 they play great music or whatever, that kind of thing. So Americana, that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I, I really respect that. Uh, Alex is in a band, um, his band Oblio, um, the, the, one of the other members, uh, Blake, uh, Blake Russell is um, really into Dylan and it shows in his writing. Um, but, you know, it's like wine. I, 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 I can drink all the wine and it's just, I, you can bring me a $500 bottle of wine. It's going to taste like a $3 bottle of wine to me. I just don't, I'm not, I just don't get it. And that's kind of the case with, uh, <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I've got this welt now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so it starts growing. I've had bad spider bites where I, my mom got bit by a brown recluse and they had, she had to go to the hospital. It was bad. I think those are more common in Indiana than here. We have black widows. Um, and I, I've seen black widows in not in the house, but outside. Um, Lena, oh, sorry. I'm Actually, writing a song is not an intimidating thing. We need to be brave. You're right. Exactly. 100% right. Yeah. And okay. If you just want to send me the song, you could probably do that through a private. Not that I ever checked the private. See, I probably have 15 private messages here waiting for me in Discord that I've never checked. But um, no, that's not true. Because, But I, I, I may not, may or may not see it. Let's see. What's that? Oh, John sent me something. See? Um, mod talk. Okay, you guys are talking. Oh my gosh, you got 111 messages I haven't seen in mod talk. Is that true? Holy cow. See, that's what I'm talking about. I really don't look at these other tabs over here. Home. OBS community. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Oh, wait, friends? Yeah. No, that doesn't mean anything. Okay. All right. Okay. So yeah, I'm not I'm not sure, but um, also I filmed two videos last week. One's gonna take a while to edit, um, but the the I did a video why so many banjos. That one I may throw up sooner than um, later. And and remember, play a banjo, go to jail. <laughs> so, um, oh, recluses, yes, recluses are big, yeah. Yeah, oh, the brown recluse, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can get big, yeah, right. Oh, nice. Snoopy. Well, and that's another thing. You know, you song could be very short. You could go, hey, I'm going to write a jingle, a new jingle for McDonald's. I mean, you know who wrote 
you know, you deserve a break today, so get out and get away to McDonald's. You know who wrote that, right? Barry Manilow. He also write, wrote, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. That's freaking Barry Manilow. That's how old that is. That was before, he wrote that before he was famous. And he does, in his show, he'll do a medley of all the, um, he did um, ba band, uh, Band-Aid brand, right? Didn't he do the Band-Aid? Because Band-Aid stuck on me. I'm stuck on Band-Aid because Band-Aid stuck on me. That's, I think, Barry Manilow. And I think he also did, he didn't do two all be patty special sauce, less cheese pickles. That's not him. Uh, what's the other one? There's another one. Yeah, Barry Manilow is freaking amazing. Uh, and, and, you know, I think Mandy is a great song. He would do too many key changes. You know, we talk about key. We haven't even, that, but the key could be multiple keys in a song. And you can do that. It's just, to me, it's, it's a lazy way to create dynamics. But it is a way to create dynamics, to momentum, to change the key, uh, uh, to create, um, to create um, uh, drama. <laughs> Great drama. I'm looking for spiders. Hey, Julian Samuels, are you kidding? Is this Julian Samuels from Houston, my co-bandmate? Oh my gosh. I, is, is Paul Meyer on here? We got two ex-bandmates on. Um, Julian Samuel is actually a very good guitar player and singer. He he was into Prince before anyone else I know. Like he he hipped us to Prince. We did a, didn't we do I Want to Be Your Lover in our band at, at Rendezvous? I don't know. Of course, I may be talking to a totally different Julian Samuel, but um. But yeah, modulation is one of those things that's like, ah. and, and you do want to create drama. We talk about tension and release when you're writing songs um, uh, or when you're playing, when you're, not even when you're writing songs, when you're creating a guitar solo or when you're soloing over. Um, Jake Starr! Can't imagine me working with a vocal coach. Oh yeah, yeah, I know, right? I actually took some vocal lessons uh, and they help. It was more about breathing, you know, um, and, and I think, I think the tr there's a truism that you can add to your top range, but you can your the your bottom range is what you're born with. You can't really increase your bottom range. Now I've heard people say that's not true, um, but for the most part, that's been my realization. So with proper technique, I was able to add a couple notes to my. <laughs> that's awesome. Good to see you, man. Holy cow! We got to do a we got to get a band reunion, <laughs> Scott. I just I actually was on the phone. I talked to Randy for like I mean uh, I talked to. Uh, Brad Ray, the drummer, for like an hour the other day, um, he was telling me how he's making. He you know lives up in Wisconsin. Couldn't be. He's like straight north of you. <laughs> You're in Houston, and he's in, in Wisconsin, way up north. And he's gotten into he's gotten into making maple syrup, which I'm like sweet, literally. Um, but yeah, Julian, we've been we're just starting a new series. This is the first episode on songwriting. And uh, we're just kind of going into some of the elements of what makes a song. Um, and it could be as little as those first three. Actually, if it's an instrumental song, it could be... Like, I've got a song. My next song coming out is... Um, this is my next release. And it's just solo guitar. I don't have a thumbnail right now, so that makes it really hard. But I'll, I'll, as soon as Emma's done with the artwork, I'll post it. Um, uh, it's already uploaded to CD Baby and ready to go. I just need artwork, and then I'm done. Um, but yeah, Julian, super, super great to see you. Um, I, if you're ever in L.A., you've got to make sure you let me know. Uh, we, we, to we would hang. could totally hang. Um, but yeah, Julian um, and I, you know, Julian, <laughs> some of the stories I've told you guys, you know, Julian was right there. <laughs> I, Julie and I, if you're still there, I think I told, I told the story about how we stayed, we went down to IU, Indiana University. Um, oh, it's Scott's birthday. Oh, dang. But Scott's not in Indianapolis. He's up at North. Oh, sweet. Okay, good, good. Yeah, you should be writing. Um, but we, we, uh, 
Scott, uh, no, we went to, um, uh, we went to Bloomington, Indiana to play, uh, for a frat party on Saturday night and then a, an ice cream social at another frat house on Sunday afternoon. And we were in high school. In fact, Julian was a year, at least a year younger. The bass player was like, Pat was like four years younger than us. He was like 13. And we all go down to, <laughs> go down to, to Indiana University and we're playing frat party. Well, we didn't, have, we didn't want to drive down twice. So my, my sister's boyfriend was an art professor at Indiana University, and he let us stay at his art studio, which was a house in just right in Bloomington. So we we just are crashing in a room. We all brought sleeping bags, and we're just sleeping in there. Well, we had a girl singer, and Janice, <laughs> she didn't want to sleep near any of the guys because she was scared uh, of the guy. I'm like, what are you scared? But anyway, it's funny. She would only sleep next to me because she trusted me, and I was like, is that? I guess that's a good thing, right? <laughs> We we opened for Roadmaster that weekend. I don't remember that. That's crazy. Yeah, Rick and I became very good friends who passed away just a couple of years ago. It was a bummer. Um, I lost like a bunch of friends in 2019 to cancer. It's just like crazy. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was it was um, uh, it was a funny weekend. But uh, uh, yeah, the, we we got into some trouble. That's for sure. We definitely had fun. Um, I remember we would back in the in the seventies. A big thing was collecting beer cans, and and especially in the mid seventies. And so part of S Scott's uh, pu you know early teen years was collecting beer cans. And so he had them all in display. They had he had all these little thin shelves all over his basement, and they had just hundreds of beer cans. And we knew it was a good uh, <laughs> Janice, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. We had uh, we we would we would determine if it was a good rehearsal or not by how many bear cans fell off their shelves, right, Julie? Oh my gosh! I remember though one time. What was it? Did we do this to you or to Pat? Where we put the output of the the I had a tape I had a tape echo. I wish I still had it. Uh, I think it was a Univox Echo. Oh my gosh, I'm going to look one up right now on Reverb and I'm going to be de so depressed at how much these things cost. Uh, I think it was a Univox, Univox Tape Echo. Oh, what are you doing? Why did you not? I t clicked in there. Univox Tape Echo. Yeah, it was this. Oh! Well, interesting. Maybe it's because you can't find tapes for them. <laughs> you probably make your own. Only 200 bucks. That's pretty much what I had, though. Oh, yeah, the cartridge. Yeah, I, yeah. So I, we, <laughs> you could set the echo to be 100%. <laughs> so we, but we put the echo delay way short. And then we took the um, we took the uh, the mic was in the PA system. We took the PA system output into the echo, put it at 100 percent, put the delay very fast, but it was just delayed like 20, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds, and then put it back into the PA system. And, and I, I forget if it was Julian or if it was Pat that was trying to sing and he couldn't do it because it was delayed uh, from the band. It was pretty funny. We were just goofing off. I just remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I've not invited any of those other people to hang with me in L.A. because I don't want to hang out with these people. <laughs> Julian's like, dang, Tom, you're mean. No, Julian, you don't understand. You see how many, what number are we at here? 232. I've been hanging out with these people for 232 live streams for the most part. Bruce, a lot of these people have been here almost since day one. Uh, Bruce, you've been here for forever. We're not worthy. Uh, no, if any of you are in L.A., you got to let me know. We'll go get lunch. And that's all I'm talking about. I don't want to have Julian's baby or anything. <laughs> so, um, it was Pat. Yeah, yeah. I, Pat was an easy mark. I mean, it may have been you and I may have conspired to do that, actually. You probably, it may have been you that knew that, I, that it could do that. I didn't even know that you could do 100% 
wet, you know. Um, so I'm kind of shocked that those things only go for 200 bucks. But I'm the thing is, is that that finding the it's a cartridge. So finding a tape cartridge, you probably have to take this apart and redo it. It looks like it's made out of plastic. So it, yeah, I don't think you can. Yeah, I wonder if it's even missing some elements for sure, like handle fuse, back cover, etc. Huh. Yeah, I, I, I can see where that would be a real. You can still get, yeah, but an Echoplex, like those are $2,000. But you can get those worked on still. Echo Fix. Oh, this is a new one. So they're doing an Echoplex reissue tape echo echo fix wow 2250 those are new that's crazy yeah it's always fun to watch the tape go in one of those things because it's random um anyway i'm gonna head it's been two and a half hours so um again i'll use a lot of my own songs for examples um when i'm when i'm um when i'm talking about harmony or arrangement or melody. Um, if I'm talking about melody or lyrics, it'll be older songs. I really haven't written a lot of melody and lyrics lately. Um, but I actually like it. You know, Madeline is a nice tune. I have older songs um, that um, could very well be recorded. They may not be, you know, modern sounding, but that's kind of my point. I, I would have a very difficult time writing a modern lyric or a modern melody. That's why when I work with uh, young pop artists, they do the writing. Um, and uh, uh, let's see. Um, I, only Miles, I can I can post like, I can't play it, but um, let's see. I think all of Miles' songs are up there. Let's see what's up here. Yeah, California Reaper, I did a... I did a... Um, He did a video for this. So this is one of the songs uh, that I wrote, basically started with me, um, called California Reaper. Um, and let's see, I'll, I'll put, I'll put this so you can listen to it. Um, I did a video on how to play this, so you can check that out. Um, that's one of Miles' songs off of his new record. Um, I got three songs on this record, I'm just trying to find the others. Mm. Let's see. Does these have a, does have a play? oh here we go. We're done. Well, California Reaper, I wish it would get more views. Um I also did um Said the Sky, that's another one that again, these are I just created and the, the songs are written over my guitar hook. So my guitar was the first thing written. And um, um, and so what was written, the melodies and the lyrics, which again were done by someone who's a more concept, content, you know, ha has a better concept of, of contemporary melodies. You know, if I did more study, I, and I'll tell you, here's a study, a little thing you could do. Um, <laughs> put together, you know, and Spotify, you may have already done this, but put together like 70 playlists, 80s playlists, 90s playlists, or you can just, there's a million of them up there already. You can listen to a 90s playlist or an 80s playlist or a 2000 or 2010 and notice how the melodic sensibilities change with, you know, it, there's overlap on the decades, like fashion overlap is always, you know, the 50s fashion stuff continued until the Beatles. And then the Beatles you know, that 60s fashion continued into the 70s. And then the 70s fashion, you know, started, you know, disco era, you know, whatever. That all kind of continued into a little into the 80s and then the 80s and so on and so forth. There's a carryover. There's like things don't change on as soon as the decade changes. But you'll you'll hear certain melodic things that were uh, very, very common um, uh <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, no, he's just being making a joke. Um, but, uh, 
But uh, and that's one of the things. Uh, just uh, just to, just so you know, um, if, a lot of times you can tell the difference between a Paul McCartney song and a John Lennon song in the Beatles. John Lennon would often do. Um, well, when I see. Often write the one note melody. When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. He would do those kind of drony melodies. Uh, a cool uh, melody. Um, One, like we can talk about harmonies too. Um, there's three types of harmonies basically. There's parallel movement. So if I were to do um, that in parallel, uh, it would be like that would be parallel movement. Okay. Contrary movement would be so. The, in other words. The melody, the harmony that would be a parallel harmony. They're moving together. They're just well, you can't see my two fingers, but you know they're they're basically going to this. Okay, contrary harmony would be going in different directions. Um, so you might do I don't know. Let's see. You know, might have something to something like that or whatever um, with. I, I, I'd have to sit down and write it. Um, that would be contrary harmony. So the harmonies are going in different directions. At times, they can go in and out, weaving up and down. Okay. Um, or static harmony, which I like a lot. And that is, you just stay on one note. And that's what the Beatles did on. One of the... Uh, You know, they can, you can sing one note of it. So that's, a, that's called a, a, a static harmony. Um, and then I, I do this thing where if I'm trying to come up with a harmony, kind of on the fly, like if I'm accompanying someone and they're singing and I want to sing harmony with them, uh, as long as I know the words, I'm golden. Um, I do what's called sing a string. So if a, you know, a song is G. I could go. So I just, whatever note is on that string, that's the note I sing. Okay, so if I just pick a string, that means I'm pretty much only going to be playing two, maybe three notes. So if the, if the song were G, C, F, C, and I'm playing the, and I'm thinking the D string. Duh. I wouldn't want to make that the melody of a song that would be boring but as a harmony it can be very interesting because you're really you're really supporting the harmonic structure um, and uh, not so much the melody you're 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 really you're you're singing um, the chords more than you're singing with the singer the melody but that could create some nice you know moments For you, it's very easy when, you know, if I just sing one string, all I have to do is kind of lock my ear into what I'm... It's cool. It's a cool trick. I did a video on that, Sing a String. It's kind of a, I call it Sing a String. And uh, it's just something I came up with on when I needed to come up with harmonies in a band. So, yeah, true. Yeah, John Prime is a great writer, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of it, like, whatever they listened to when they were kids had a big effect. I mean, that definitely affected Paul. So...
Um, Well, and Sam, there's maybe a, there may be your lyrics for your song. Um, again, I could I could talk for hours on this. I mean, it's pretty clear. Um, but with lyrics, the other thing is you don't want to be too on point. Um, here's the, the thing I told you about, and I've said this before, but worship music is the most formulaic music you could write. And I've written worship songs for churches. And I've had songs published. In fact, Josh, I don't know if you're still there, but I'm going to send you. Um, yeah, ooze and ahs totally works for ooze and ahs. Yeah, you don't have to, uh, Julian, that is actually exactly what you would do for ooze and ahs. Uh, you would not do an ooh, ah, uh, that, 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 that was a parallel harmony because it would be, you would lose, you would lose the, um, uh, you would, you would lose the, the lyrics, the, the lead singer, if he was singing the melody and you had all like three people harmonizing and they were doing oohs and ahs with the melody, you couldn't hear the words. Uh, in fact, I saw this great production technique, Julian, as you're producing your tracks, any of you are producing tracks, what you can do on your background vocals, if you do background vocals on your songs, and especially if they're harmonies or whatever, is turn on the de -er on your background vocals, okay? The de -er gets rid of the gets rid of some of the syllabants in lyrics. And um, the English language is full of the S. Um, like, Lena, and, I, and this is not intended to be offensive, but when anyone imitates someone else's language, they imitate what they think they hear. So, like, when people think Chinese, they go, ying, yang, yong, 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 like that, right? So uh, if I pretend to speak Chinese, I'm going, yong, 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 okay. When people pretend to speak English, they go, and Lena, I don't know, you, you've, you've not spoken English your entire life, so, so you might remember like imitating English, but they go, si, sang, song, sung, song, so everything has an S in it, in our language. And, and it, when you realize that, you start to hear it a lot more and you go, dang. So that, but the S, the problem with the S in a melody context, in a vocal context on a song, is that unless the singers are dead locked on, and even if they are, too many S's, if you've got four singers, too many S's can really create this flutter effect. So what you do is you turn up the there's a there's a plugin you call it's called a deesser and it will kind of chop off that high frequency that is prevalent in the the syllabants the s syllabants and um, uh, the deesser it's a plugin yeah so if you have Logic um, I don't know if it exists in GarageBand do I have GarageBand I don't even know if I have GarageBand. Sometimes I delete these programs because I don't use them. Uh, let me see if I have GarageBand. Oops. Dang. I gotta get I gotta get to work. <laughs> Let's see here. Make sure my sound is off. Yeah, um, it's I'm loading GarageBand right now. It's been forever. Oh yeah, download later. Okay. Yeah, I don't need. Uh, interesting. Wanted to access. Um, I haven't opened it, so it's telling me what's new. Okay, so empty project. It looks just like Logic. Hilarious. All right, so let me add. So if you have a Mac, you have a uh, GarageBand. Oh my gosh. Stop. Okay. Uh, I want recording's microphone. Okay. Input one. All right. All right. So if I click on... Uh, recording settings. Yeah. Plugins. Here we go. Plugins. As a noise gate, master echo, click edit echo and reverb settings. It's pretty basic. I don't see a de -er on here. It's kind of, it's doing the spinning beach ball of death. Um, I see echo and reverb. Oh, I have an edit button. 
ambience, different. I can change the home. I don't see. Yeah, um, I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna, I may have to force quit. No, I don't. Once it stops the spinning beach ball of death, I'll. Um, I don't see a deesser in GarageBand, but but a DS is a plug-in. Oh, you can kind of get the same effect by just rolling off some of the top end, but then some of the, um, uh, you might lose some intelligibility. Uh, but oftentimes people aren't singing the S's at the same time. So if you have, if you, if you can visualize the tracks, the four tracks and the S's, let's say they say the word stop. Stop in the name of love, right? You could have four different placements of the stop so it could end up with this stop <laughs> and it just kind of like robs the main vocal from its its impact especially on a word like stop you want the word stop to have impact that's another thing we, we're going to talk about like the genre genre or the groove or the tempo will all affect what melodies work and what lyrics work you know you, you, if you're doing a sad song, you may not want. Well, you may, you may. You know, tempo of two twenty beats per minute or something like that. Um, let's see. Okay, no, I, I just, I don't see. I could be wrong, but anyway, I'm not gonna. Um, I don't need to any more logic. I don't need any more garage band stuff. So, um, but yeah, so you can look DSer. No, DSer. That's pretty much the name. That's what it's called. Uh, let's see what it's called. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's what it's called in Logic. Um, it's under Dynamics, I think. Yeah, DSer, under Dynamics. Um, it's a dynamic thing. It's like compression EQ. It would it would come under that category. And there's settings: female vocal, split band, female vocal, male vocal, master, smoothing, tame upper mids. Um, but basically what it does is it, it kind of gets rid of all those S's. It can be really, syllabus, you know, can be a real issue with, um, uh, I don't want this on, um, can be a real issue with mixing records. It can be cause a lot of problems. And so, so that's, I saw that trick on one of the producers. So again, the trick was we leave the main vocal alone, but the background vocals turn up the DS or on the background vocals and you can group them together and then turn up, put a master, a DS or on the master and turn it up. You can even, you could even draw it in so that it, it's like only really going into play when there are S's, you know, you can, you can turn it on and off wherever you need it. So you can, you can automate that. Um, it's kind of like a compressor. It's a little different. It's kind of like a compressor mixed with an EQ mixed with a limiter. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a, you know, uh, basically what you should do is sing a little bit and then turn it all the way up and notice what it does. That's, that's always what I do. It's like, okay, what does this thing do? <laughs> Let's see what it does in the extreme. Yeah, the PC police are coming to me. Lena, Lena's gone now. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Holly, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, you sound like a bunch of... It's exactly right. Dudley, the pastor of our church, we had to get on him because he would let his S's go forever sometimes. So he would say something like, uh, get out your Bibles. Like that. And it's like, dude, you sound like a snake. I do? <laughs> so he had, to, he had to kind of retrain himself not to let his S's kind of linger with his thought, you know? Um not not good for a pastor to sound like a snake, but I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, let's see. DBX86 is a channel strip preamp that has the or live. Yep. Okay, thank you, David. Yep. I remember that. Um, there, yeah, you can get rack mount DSers. Um, and you could probably use a compressor or a limiter as a DSer or even EQ as a DSer. Um, it's not, it's been around for a long time. Um Uh, yeah, well, it's my knees hurt. Yeah, you're saying uh, we didn't really have music when I was growing up, but all my songs have 70s feel. Yeah, it's and that's nothing wrong with that because there's a lot of I mean, look at um, who's the who's the pop artist that does all the R&B throwbacks, you know, Earth, Wind and & Fire and 
Commodores and all that stuff, uh, uh, Bruno Mars, um, you know, he, he's, he gets totally into it. Like arrangement, like you think about, look at all this list. How, there we go. <laughs> look at this list here. And, you know, it's like whatever was 70s, it's hard to point. Okay, there we go. Whatever was 70s in each one of these things, that's what Bruno Mars, like what was the 70s tempo? What was, you know, the groove in the 70s? What was the genre? What was the song form of the 70s, which was different than today? Uh, you know, what were the dynamics of the timbre, the production? Production is really key. Production is a giant, giant part of the pie when it comes to pop music. When it comes to guitar and vocal, not a lot of production involved, right? Um, it might be the producer might go, well, I want to let's record at this studio because I really like the way this room sounds. Um, and um, uh, um, and other things like that. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's definitely one of the um, major, major components in in. You know, it could be 50%. It could be the reason the song's a hit. You could have a pretty crappy song. If it's got great production, it could actually get radio play. Um, and then, you know, sometimes production's real simple. Like the new the new, new Adele one, uh, pretty basic production. Piano, voice, a little bit of bass. Um, I think there's some strings in it, you know. Um, and that's a perfect example of, of, you know, all the things that we're talking about, um, and minus maybe some production. So... Okay, yeah, I got to get going, too. Oh, good. Oh, sweet. Well, there you go. Knees hurt. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. There's a lot of... DS is not a, you know, it's not rocket science. <laughs> yeah. The FedEx strikes no, don't turn left. Yep, that's right. That's one of the brilliance of GPS technology. They were able to put all their routes so they, they can make right turns only makes them highly more efficient, which is really, really brilliant. Whoever came up with that. I'll tell you another thing that I, so uh, along the lines of that, <laughs> I'm never going to end this. Like this has nothing to do with songwriting. But along the lines of that, I remember when I was in, I was teaching clinics in the 90s and we went to uh, Pennsylvania, Allentown. I was in an Allentown, Pennsylvania. And normally, in fact, not normally. Every other time we stayed, we did one of these clinics. We were in a bigger city than that. And we stayed in a nice hotel, like a Hilton, a Hyatt, uh, even a Ritz-Carlton. You know, they put us up in really nice hotels. Uh, they didn't have any of those available in Allentown. So we stayed in a motel. And my definition of a motel versus a hotel. Motel, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's one or two stories. No more than two stories. And it's basically kind of a, you know, an l shape you know, like L shape or a V shape or something. And this hotel was in an L shape and uh, it was two stories. And the manager, the guy that was booking the rooms was giving us all our rooms. And, and I noticed it was like, we were in like 210, 208, 206, 204. And then it was 109, 107, 105. And I said, why are you booking us in this weird, this like not next to each other? And he goes, well, I don't want any of you to be next to anybody. If, if, we, if we're at 50% capacity, none of you will have a neighbor above you, below you, or next to you. And it just blew my mind. I was like, dude, that's brilliant. <laughs> Is that something you learned in hotel school? He goes, no, I just came up with it myself. And whenever, whenever I go to a hotel, I always say, hey, do you guys do a checkerboard pattern? And they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, start out the first 50% of the rooms, make sure you're booking them in a checkerboard pattern so nobody has any buddy above them, below them, or next to them. And they always look at me like, well, that's a great idea. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So I love that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, so the, the, the FedEx not turning left, freaking, that's, yeah, they don't have to. Um, and that saves a lot of time, especially in big cities and busy areas downtown. Oh, my gosh, downtown, you could wait for three or four iterations of a traffic light to turn left. You know, that's, you could make 10 stops in that amount of time. So. <laughs> okay, okay, JAJ, for your sake. Oh wait, here we go. Uh, when I delivered pictures, I used to think my route, I used to think my route through when I gave a pile of pies, right turns, left turns, yep. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm a big right turn person. I, you know, I would leaving our apartment building um, in Pasadena. You know, I would turn right or left out of the unit, but that was a small street. Uh, but but if I was going to go, yeah, I would go around a block and turn right to do that rather than go to you know to 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 go rather than go left, even if it was fast, even if it was shorter. Because I just didn't, both the streets on, at the end of our street were pretty, pretty busy. So um, a lot of accidents on them. And I just figured a lot less likely to get in an accident if I'm not making a left-hand turn. So, um, a lot, of course, obviously there are times you can't avoid it. But but when when you don't have to, you don't. So, hey, Quail Studios, I'm still on. Can you believe it? Three hours later. All right. So AJ's afraid of me, <laughs> me giving him a, a nugget. So if any of you are in hotel management, uh, apply the checkerboard pattern. We'll all thank you for that. All right. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, no, production is definitely huge. No, in, in pop songs. But again, it depends on the genre because... Um, in a, in a, if it's a guitar and voice, you know, again, well, we got to use this mic. That's a producer decision a lot of times. You know, you may pick a, a C12 or something and, you know, a, a U87 for the guitar or whatever. Uh, that's producer, you know, how to mix the two things together or whatever. I usually send my songs out to be either mixed or mastered at least. I'll mix them myself, um, but I'll, I'll have them mastered. So um, sometimes I have things mixed. Anything Kelly and I do, we have mixed. <laughs> yeah, well, you can go back. It's a long three hours. Anyway, okay, I'm going to stop. Uh, next Monday, we're going to pick up from this. You can tell I'm, I'm excited. Uh, maybe have some chord progressions using those chords below or any chord progressions. I don't care. But just try to write something this week. I don't want to hear an old chord progression. I want to hear something you came up with this week. Uh, not necessarily here. We're not going to be able to do that. But um, but you can post it up on – you can even just write a little you know, chord diagram or something and post it on the Discord if you want. Okay? All right. God bless you all. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next Monday.